just for clarification, um, we are going to be hearing the bill to repeal the cabaret law, but we also have another bill regarding used car auto dealers that we want to vote out. Um, at some point, um, as my colleagues roll in um, and we get quorum to be able to vote out the bill, I'm going to put the current hearing on pause to allow for the vote to happen, then we'll go back to the cabaret. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Rafael Espinal, and I'm the chair of the Consumer Affairs Committee. Today, the committee will be holding a hearing on proposed intro bill number 1652A, a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to security cameras and security guards at certain nightlife establishments and repealing subchapter 20 of Title 20 of such code relating to licensing public dance halls, cabarets, and catering establishments, also known as the infamous cabaret law. But first, we'll be holding a vote on proposed introductions 1539A and 1540A relating to improving consumer protections against predatory lending in the used car industry. I, along with my colleague, Councilmember Dan Garodnik, have worked diligently to improve consumer protections and protect New Yorkers from a growing trend of predatory car loans. Intro 1539A requires increased disclosures to consumers about the car loans they are about to sign, as well as a two-day cancellation option that would allow consumers to cancel their sales contract and car loan within two days. The bill also strengthens penalties against used car dealers who violate its provisions. I believe these increased protections will go a long way in protecting New Yorkers from, a predatory, car, from predatory car loans. As a chair, I recommend a yes vote. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote, Committee on Consumer Affairs. Uh, both items are coupled. Chair Espinal. I vote aye. Gentili. Aye. aye. Kozlowitz. I vote aye. Lanceman. By a vote of four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Both introductions have been adopted by the committee. All right. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, we can close the roll. Our hearing on the cabaret law today represents a continuation of this committee's efforts to improve the regulation of the nightlife industry. Many of us can agree that the city's cabaret law needs to be updated and modernized to respond to ever-changing trends in the industry. From its inception in 1926, the cabaret law has been used to target particular establishments and has not been equally enforced in its application. It is time we right this historical wrong and remove New York City's inappropriate, arbitrarily enforced dancing license. On August 24th, we passed intro, intro bill number 1688, a local law to amend the New York City Charter in relation to establishing an Office of Nightlife and a Nightlife Advisory Board. 
Intro 1688 represents an important first step towards reform. I hope that this, I hope that with the establishment of the Office of Nightlife and a Nightlife Advisory Board, we can begin the task of updating many more of our laws and regulations in order to restore and enhance the city's nighttime economy. And think progressively about new ideas to plan our city so that nightlife goers, artists, local residents, and government can all communicate and live in harmony. The bill we are hearing today, proposed intro 1652A, represents another important step towards this goal. By repealing the cabaret license, we are moving towards decriminalizing dancing in New York City. We acknowledge that this issue goes beyond the license and that reforms to zoning laws are also necessary. But I'm confident that the changes we are implementing today are a move in the right direction. Proposed intro 1652A also preserves existing safety measures. It does not repeal requirements to employ only licensed security guards in the installation of surveillance cameras or comply with fire and electrical safety codes. Current questions about the viability of city's nightlife are hampering New York City's cultural reputation. The city's nighttime economy is estimated to be around $10 billion. If the city does not take steps to repeal or significantly modernize our laws, we risk crippling New York City's cultural and artistic development and overburdening businesses. More than this, we continue to uphold a historical blight that has no place on our current books. Dancing does not need to be licensed. The committee looks forward to hearing from advocates, the mayor's office, the Department of Consumer Affairs, and its sister agencies, the industry, and other interested parties on these topics. So with that said, I'd like to call up the administration uh, to address intro 1652A. But when you may, may please raise your right hand so we can administer the oath. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Chairman Espinal and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs. I am Lindsey Green, a senior advisor to the Deputy Mayor for Housing and Economic Development. I work closely with several agencies that are involved in economic development, public space, and business opportunity, including the Department of Consumer Affairs, the Department of Small Business Services, and the New York City Economic Development Corporation, among others. I am joined today by two colleagues from city agencies that touch the nightlife and entertainment industries. Shira Gann, Senior Director of Policy and Programs at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, and Tamela Boyd, General Counsel at the Department of Consumer Affairs. I will be giving testimony on behalf of the administration today on the cabaret repeal and nightlife security bill, and Shira and Cham Tamela are joining me for Q&A. We are pleased to be representing Mayor Bill de Blasio's administration here today. Uh, first, Chairman Espinal, I want to thank you again for your leadership in surfacing and trying to resolve issues relating to the nightlife economy broadly. Uh, second, I want to reiterate how excited we are to work with you and your colleagues as we establish our Office of Nightlife at MoM and uh, build out and begin working with the Nightlife Advisory Board. As we stated at the hearing for 16, intro 1688, this administration feels strongly that the nightlife uh, economy is essential to the New York City economy and overall culture, and we want to help the industry flourish while also ensuring that New Yorkers are safe and secure while they're in enjoying the diversity of the city's entertainment and nightlife offerings. With regards to our specific topic today, the so-called cabaret law, I want to state clearly that the administration and Mayor de Blasio strongly support repealing the current cabaret law while simultaneously retaining the requirements for nightlife establishments to maintain certain security measures. We feel there are better ways than the current cabaret law to create a strong and healthy nightlife economy while also ensuring the safety and security of everyone participating in that economy. As it relates to the specifics of the legislation under consideration today, I, I want to make a few brief comments. As you know, the Department of Consumer Affairs currently issues licenses under the cabaret law, which was first enacted in 1926. This re law requires businesses to obtain a license before operating a, a cabaret or a catering establishment. With the repeal of the cabaret law, uh, catering establishments will continue to be regulated as food service establishments by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Under the proposed legislation, the cabaret license would be eliminated, reducing the administrative burden on businesses on business owners that, that were labeled as such. Instead, certain businesses classified as nightlife establishments would, would be required to maintain security cameras and ensure that any security guards they employ are properly licensed and registered. These security measures represent the unique safety and security elements of the cabaret law that we feel are important to retain, and we must ensure that these necessary public safety provisions are retained in a manner that is enforceable. 
However, uh, as written, the current legislation proposes uh, placing the security requirements in the Department of Consumer Affairs section of the administrative code, while all enforcement responsibility would um, be undertaken by the police department, which would issue any violations of the proposed law. As such, we feel strongly that the security requirements in the proposed legislation should be placed within the public safety section of the administrative code. We think that an important aspect of repealing the cabaret law is to reduce the administrative burden on businesses, which is important work we have been doing in the context of our broader fine reduction efforts and our small business first efforts, and as well as some specific legislative items we've undertaken um, with your colleagues. Placing security requirements for nightlife establishments in DCA's code would simply create confusion by giving the impression that the agency would still be involved in nightlife regulation, directly undermining a key benefit of this legislative proposal and our collective goal of streamlining the regulatory landscape for New York City businesses. In fact, DCA will have no involvement in, the, in either the Office of Nightlife or the enforcement of these public safety laws. Aside from this point, however, we look forward to working with you on ensuring this legislation maintains both public safety and vibrant nightlife industry in this city. Lastly, I want to remind members of the committee that the City of New York is in active proceedings regarding a challenge to the city's cabaret law. As such, we will unfortunately not be able to comment on certain aspects of the, of the cabaret law uh, in questions today. Again, I want to echo that the de Blasio administration firmly believes in the importance of nightlife and entertainment to the city's economy, culture, and identity, and we look forward to working with you on our plans for helping the industry flourish, flourish and expand in a safe and responsible way. Repealing the cabaret law while maintaining important safety provisions will go a long way to ensuring that New Yorkers can fully enjoy the city's vast array of nightlife venues. Thank you for inviting us to testify here today. We'll welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to give my colleagues a chance to, to ask questions first because I know uh, they, have, they have a schedule that they have to attend to. But my, my, I guess my direct and clear question, um, did I hear correctly when, when you said that the administration and, the mayor, and Mayor de Blasio is on board with repealing the cabaret law? With the current proposal to retain the security measures, yes, we support repealing the cabaret law. Great. So I guess today's conversation will be more focused towards security and how mm -hmm. we move forward on, on, that, on that front. Okay. All right. With that said, I want to um, allow Vinny Gentile to ask a few questions. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for being here. I'm just not clear what the definition of a cabaret is in the law. I mean, what is the difference? How do you tell the difference between a restaurant? Uh, or a cabaret? I think in, in the cabaret law, the way it's currently written, uh, I think that was challenging uh, at times, which is why we feel like the direction we're moving with the proposed amendments actually goes a long way towards clarifying the universe more as, as traditional nightclubs or nightlife establishments by focusing on occupancy levels and hours of operation and on-premise alcohol consumption. You're saying that's what the new proposal is? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. We support that language. So we wouldn't have that confusion, you're saying? We, we are focused on re reducing that by, by changing those requirements, yes. Okay. And as far as the enforcement goes, you're saying uh, not DCA, but? The police department. Police department. Okay, yes. I missed that. Okay, yes. so it's the police department yes. that you're saying. So it should be in the administrative code under public safety? Yes. I see. Okay, very good. Thank you. Mm hmm I guess my question um, goes to the, the placement of the bill language um, to other agencies. Sure. Um, there, there, I've been hearing a lot of concerns from business owners that shifting the, the camera provisions into um, public safety uh, would um, end up in heavier enforcement on their businesses, uh, kind of give um, free range right for the NYPD to be able to enter the business at any point that they like to or, or more frequently than they like to and kind of use the cameras as a, as a reason to get into the door. Is that something that, have, that the administration has thought about or have any concerns about? Uh, we've, we've discussed it certainly. I think, um, you know, certainly uh, nightlife regulation is not the primary um, focus or priority of the police department. They, can, they conduct 
uh, investigations and visit establishments um, when there is a safety concern, which is consistent with how they've they've interacted with this law to date. I don't uh, believe anyone feels that that would change. And the uh, notion of having the camera requirement in the codes uh, simply goes to it's it's something it's a tool that that we feel in the interest of public safety is helpful for businesses to have in the event of a serious issue where having access to footage might be helpful to an investigation. Uh, one, one idea that we were floating around internally was about shifting it to the building code uh, so that when uh, business owners uh, go and, and get their places inspected um, to get their permits and, and licenses that the, the cameras would be actually be inspected at that point. Um, is there any hesitation to that idea? I, I think um, you know, certainly I understand the desire to have it as part of an inspection. I think um, the nature of the cameras differs from the majority of the building code, which is about a different type of, of, of construction safety measures as opposed to sort of broader public safety, uh, but it's something we can keep discussing. Correct. How many violations to date have there been of the security guard and surveillance camera provisions? To, to our knowledge, we don't uh, unfortunately have the ability to easily access the type of specific subchapter of, of the Kevry law that might have been subject to a violation. Um, we, I do know anecdotally that in the instances of um, certain uh, major incidents, having access to footage has been helpful, uh, but we don't have an ability to break down if the violation was specifically about having the cameras or not. Okay. There's also concern about uh, the way the bill's currently written, that it will capture uh, thousands of, of new businesses that um, in the past has, didn't have to uh, install security cameras. Do you see that same issue, or do you think that's something that the administration would want, ideally want? I, I think um, we're still trying to get a, a handle on the scope in, in terms of number. I, I think by trying to make it um, more focused on sort of nightclub-like establishments, we, we don't think we are we are trying not to sweep in new businesses that would not previously have been covered, but we're continuing to try to figure out the nature of that universe. It's not, it's not the intention to add regulation where we didn't think it was necessary before. Okay, so we're, we're actually currently also currently exploring on, on ways to make sure the bill language, again, only, cover, only captures uh, the businesses that currently have cameras. Um, is that something that you'll be interested in, in um, talking about and considering moving forward? I, we can certainly talk about it. I think there are probably, if in, in the event there are large establishments with on-premise alcohol consumption who operate late into the night who don't have cameras, we certainly would want them to have cameras. Um, so if, if, if there's a concept that does both, we'd, we'd be happy to entertain it. I mean, being that the administration is on board with repealing the cabaret law, and um, the only discussion here is really about the safety of the patrons and these establishments, I, I really don't have any other questions. Um, I don't know if my colleagues do. No. I guess my last question is: the state the state law currently um, covers the need for security guards in these establishments. Is it necessary to have the security guard uh, language in the bill? I think we, we believe it's generally helpful given um, we do think it's an important uh, safety feature to have any security guards that are employed actually be licensed. Uh, and so in the event that we don't control what happens with state law, we'd like to have the same requirements here in local law. Okay, great. Well, thank you. You guys are free to go. Thank you. <laughs>
which is an honor to have her here today. Thank you for coming. Yeah. We have Max Travis from Much More and Associates LLC. Jerry Goldman. Frankie Hutchinson from Dance Liberation. Olympia Kazi of the New York City Artists Coalition. And Rachel Nelson. Ms. Ellington, you could bring, you could begin. Just state your name uh, before you give your testimony. I'm gonna turn the, the mic on. You bring it closer. Yeah. It's okay now. Yeah. All right. Good afternoon, Chairman and distinguished members of the City Council Committee on Com Consumer Affairs. Uh, I'd like to. Okay. I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify, and I'd like to thank the council members, Council Member Espinel, and the. Uh, sponsors of this bill for taking the initiative to repeal the existing cabaret law, thereby reuniting live music with live dancing. Uh, who am I? You, were, you heard my introduction. Yes, um, I'm appearing on behalf of my musical Ellington family, headed by my grandfather, Edward Kennedy Duke Ellington, who insisted the entire family and close friends address him as Uncle Edward and my father, Mercer, who called him Pop. My dad picked up the baton after my grandfather's death in 1974 and most notably conducted the band on stage for sophisticated ladies on Broadway. And now I have picked up the baton as founder and president of the Duke Ellington Center for the Arts, a 501c3 in the educational uh, entity. I am a performer, choreographer, director, producer, and historian of sorts. I was sent to kindergarten at 18 months old, and when I was three, I made my stage debut as a snowflake in the Nutcracker Suite in a local uptown dance recital. I majored in dance and received a BS degree from the Juilliard School of Music in 1980, 1960. I've been dancing ever since. The year that JFK was assassinated was my first year as a June Taylor dancer on the Jackie Gleason show, and that event caused quite a stir, as you can imagine. I currently participate in ballroom dance competitions in the rhythm category, samba, rumba, cha-cha, paso doble, and jive. But enough about me and my qualifications. Let's get to the current situation. The freedom to be beyond category to explore and express through music and dance is our human responsibility. The current cabaret laws were designed to restrict, curtail, and separate these freedoms. Moving and dancing is a natural reaction and response to the sounds we hear coming from our musicians. Please repeal the cabaret law. It has no place here in the greatest city on earth or anywhere on this earth. My grandfather's orchestra was at one time the house band at the original Cotton Club in Harlem. The club boasted its fair of bands of color and white only audiences. Yet the Savoy Ballroom, a few blocks away, packed in around 5,000 dancers a night in an integrated situation. Astor Piazzolla, the famous tango composer, used to frequent the Cotton Club and was said to be inspired by Ellington to break out of his traditional tango musical, musical structure and create extended compositions. Both composers were inspired to write their music for dancers. Both composers were highly criticized for straying from their normal accepted 
structure of their compositions. These days, musicians seldom get an opportunity to play in clubs or restaurants, and then dancing is not allowed. Musicians inspire dancers, inspire musicians. Please repeal the cabaret law. The dance police who are able to shut down the clubs when a few enthusiastic pa patrons get up and move to the music can turn their attention to other really disruptive situations, and maybe they'll feel a little better if they start to swing and sway themselves. <laughs> Thank you so much. You may begin. Is it on? I don't know. Turn this off. Hello. Hello, my name is Max Travis. I'm an associate at Much More and Associates PLLC. The principal attorney of our firm uh, is challenging the constitutionality of the cabaret law in federal court, and I'm going to read part of his statement. After a decade of inaction by the city, despite unsuccessful attempts at reform by the Bloomberg administration, I commenced a constitutional challenge to the cabaret law in federal court on behalf of my own music venue. I argued that, at least in the context of a live music venue, dancing is protected First Amendment expression. Almost every culture around the world has developed unique forms of music and dance, and these traditions are often central to one's cultural identity. Even if social dancing were not protected by the First Amendment, the rights of musicians and other performers clearly are. As a practical matter, my establishment, much more, is required by the cabaret law to censor musical genres that might lead to dancing. We can play folk music or experimental electronic music, but we cannot allow DJs or any kind of dance music. Most forms of hip hop and Latin music are dance oriented, which has a disparate impact on minority musicians. Together with the racial motivation behind the cabaret law, this creates a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. The cabaret law is also unconstitutionally vague and overbroad. It does not define dancing, leaving officers to guess when toe tapping, head nodding, or swaying exceed permissible bounds. It defines a public dance hall as any room, place, or space in the city in which dancing is carried on and to which the public may gain admission. This could include a church, a wedding, or even this very chamber. It defines a cabaret as any room, place, or space in the city in which any musical entertainment, singing, dancing, or other form of amusement is permitted in connection with a restaurant business. An unlawful other form of amusement could be almost any behavior that tends to elicit a smile. In demonstration of this, Caroline's Comedy Club was ticketed with a violation of the cabaret license, and a court said that technically it was, even though there was no dancing, they were telling jokes. If the cabaret law is repealed, what should it be replaced with? The answer is that all the laws needed to address its purported concerns were enacted years ago. To the extent the city is concerned about noise, the New York City Noise Code provides precise decibel limits that cannot be exceeded. To the extent the city is concerned about fire or overcrowding, the fire code and building code thoroughly address these issues. For an establishment to have a legal capacity of more than 74 persons, it must obtain a place of assembly certificate of operation, which requires submission of a seating plan and annual fire department inspections. I will add that uh, Councilman Espinal's uh, bill that's uh, being considered right now also adds bad the security uh, requirements, but for establishments that have more than 150 persons, not every establishment and space in the city. New York is one of the most heavily regulated jurisdictions on earth. Were I not a lawyer, I could not have established a small music venue here. People with less resources and less exer legal expertise, including artists, musicians, and underserved communities, find the com cost of compliance beyond reach. This crisis is confounded with rising rents. In my neighborhood, Williamsburg, the number of music venues has fallen by half in two years. Artists have been priced out. New York is being sapped of its cultural vitality. I'd like to talk about zoning now. In addition to the repeal of the cabaret law, the zoning resolution must be amended to remove references to dancing. Zoning resolution section 32-15 defines use group six to include, quote, eating or drinking establishments with musical entertainment but not dancing with a capacity of 200 persons or fewer. Zoning resolution section 32-21 defines use group 12 to include, quote, eating and drinking establishments with entertainment and a capacity of more than 200 persons or establishments of any capacity with dancing. Dancing presents no unique hazards. Three people dancing is not the same as 200 people in a room. 
use groups should depend on capacity. According to zoning resolution section 32-21, use group 12 consists primarily of fairly large entertainment facilities that one, have a wide service area and generate considerable pedestrian automotive or truck traffic, and two, are therefore appropriate only in secondary major or central commercial areas. Most eating and drinking establishments are not in central commercial areas. As a result, they cannot even apply for a cabaret license. Of more than 25,000 bars and restaurants in New York City, no more than 118 can legally permit dancing. And yes, I looked this next part up, a quarter of them are the strip clubs. Entire neighborhoods such as Bedford-Stuyvesant and El Barrio lack a single location where people can legally dance in public. In conclusion, as the Founding Fathers reiterated time and again, useless laws render necessary laws ineffective. What are the necessary laws? The noise code, the fire code, the building code, the criminal code, the regulations of the state liquor authority, the regulations of the Department of Consumer Affairs. By outlawing dancing, the cabaret law forces dancing to occur in venues that are outside the realm of the necessary laws, endangering anyone who dances. A repeal of the cabaret law will move dance venues above ground where the necessary laws will be able to regulate the space in which dancing occurs. Make no mistake, the position that advocates the repeal of the cabaret law is the law and order position. Please repeal this unconstitutional and dangerous law. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jerry Goldman. I'm an attorney and I primarily handle complex high stakes litigation at a major national law firm based in New York. I'm also a daddy, and I'm a pop-pop jungle, and I'm eligible for MTA discounts. When I started campaigning to change this law, I had kids. Somehow, they're now grown-ups. I'm also a drummer. I'm a member of the board of the Dance Parade. I'm a member of Legalized Dance, and I chair the board of a nonprofit organization which promotes participatory arts both here and in the state of Nevada at Burning Man. I do all that pro bono. I was born in Brooklyn. I lived in Sunnyside, lived and went to college in the West Bronx, a mile from where hip hop came to be at the same time that hip hop came to be, was a prosecutor in Brooklyn and presently live and work in Manhattan. These remarks were all my own and not on behalf of any client, my law firm Anderson Kill, or any organization with which I'm affiliated. I do not believe that in any conflicts. I do not believe I represent any organizations that would financially benefit from any change in this le legislation. As a matter of brevity, I'll incorporate my testimony and the documents produced and submitted on June 18th, and I will submit today after the hearing a copy of my testimony. I've handed in a chart which was given to me, which represents the approximately 100 organizations which presently have cabaret law licenses in New York. And while I thank and applaud the mayor's office for the position that they've taken at today's hearing, I still believe that these remarks are important, that this hearing is important, and the testimony of those here and in the audience is important, because as I know from legislative work, Legislation isn't legislation until it's enacted. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. And I'm here to speak to you about dance, something which unifies a quite divided species, the human species. I'm here to speak to you specifically about the right to dance, which sadly, the city, our city, my city, for a host of reasons that we know are bad reasons, has deprived us of. Contrary to the rights of the people, as guaranteed by the constitutions of the state of New York and the United States of America, I suggest that this cabaret law, which was in, enacted in 1926, at the time of the regressive prohibition which existed in the city, state, and country, was flawed. I'm not an historian. I'm not a sociologist. I wasn't there when it's enacted. I do not know the true reasons why it was enacted. 
We can look at the words in the legislation, and we can look at the context of what was going on in this city, in this country. But I understand that historical environment. That historical environment was not friendly to people of color. In fact, that historical environment at that time was not friendly to people of a lot of races, a lot of religions, a lot of national origins. But I do know that at that time and afterwards how this law has been utilized. It has been utilized in a discriminatory manner based on race, based on national origin. It has been used in a discriminatory manner based on people's choice of lifestyle, on people's sexual orientation, on what they look like, how they act, and what they do. And that cannot be countenanced. It cannot be countenanced today. It's just plain wrong. It's just plain unconstitutional. And it's not fair. And this city, this city of everything else, is known as a city that strives to be fair. And for that reason alone, before we get into anything else, it has to be repealed. Dance and art. Dance and art go to our very heart. It goes to our very heart of each and every one of us in this room, and most particularly, it goes to the heart of this city, its economy, and what makes us different than a place like Cleveland. It's important now. It was important historically, and it's important for tomorrow. And for all those reasons, too, this legislation must be passed. The cabaret law has been enforced in an unfair manner. As the chair of the committee used the words, I believe, capricious and arbitrary. When laws are enforced in a capricious and arbitrary manner, it causes all to disrespect the means of enforcement of laws. If laws are enforced in a fair manner, it is good for everybody. For that reason, too, this legislation must be passed. We've heard at the prior hearing, through Mr. Muchmore and others, about the underlying legal issues. I suggest quite strongly that the analysis that the Second Department adopted a number of years ago in an upholding the statute is flawed. It's based on a flawed analysis of a Supreme Court case that was designed to protect children. That case dealt with legislation that barred adults from going into a facility where kids were dancing. We don't want that. We want a situation where we can dance. Nothing more and nothing less. Communication isn't just words on a piece of paper or spoken through a microphone at a hearing or spoken from a stage. Communication is movement. Communication is rhythm. Communication is sound. Communication is dance. Communication is when somebody looks at me in the eye. Communication is when somebody nods their head. Communication is when somebody smiles, when somebody frowns, when somebody hugs, when somebody kisses, and when somebody dances. Communication is protected speech, and dance is protected speech, and for that reason, again, this legislation must be passed. My written remarks are longer. I do not want to, nor do I believe to I take could, up I any- I listen to you all day. But for uh, the interest of, <laughs> but the interest, for, but for the interest of time, let's, let's uh, yeah, let's, let's go. Uh, I'm, I'm doing my dance hands there. Uh, um, but please, I urge you to enact this legislation. I urge 
city council to enact this legislation with reasonable protections for society. And again, thank you for all the work that all of you have done on this. Hi, my name is Olympia Kazi, and I'll read the, the New York City Artist Coalition testimony. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be back here after only three months. Uh, we were here last time to discuss the oversight, and now we're here to discuss the repeal of the cabaret law, this law that has so unfairly been criminalizing social dancing, a fundamental cultural expression. Uh, the reasons for repeal are many. Uh, with about 100 active uh, cabaret licenses and over 25,000 venues where New Yorkers may dance, we're experiencing a de facto ban on social dancing in New York City. A prohibition era law with a racist and homophobic legacy has no place in contemporary society. Today, the cabaret law is not enforced across the board, but arbitrarily. Thus, it allows for discriminatory practices by law enforcement agencies. So a law that is not supposed to be enforced should actually not be in the books. Um, this law, with its out-of-scale permitting requirements and zoning restrictions, that's going to be the next thing we need to address, uh, uh, it's a, a great burden on small businesses and grassroots cultural spaces. It also affects the livelihood of many when it becomes the means for closing uh, the venues. Last but not least, this law makes all New Yorkers unsafe by forcing us to dance in um, unlicensed spaces that for obvious reasons avoid city safety, security controls, and assistance. So the New York City Artist Coalition advocates for the safety and preservation of informal cultural spaces. And in the past few months, we've worked with uh, the Dance Liberation Network and Dance Parade and many other great organizations that will be testifying here today in a relentless campaign to legalize social dancing and to ensure cultural vibrancy and safety for all New Yorkers. So I'm gonna, uh, you know, I was very happy to hear today that the de Blasio administration is supporting the repeal, but uh, as Jerry explained, there is a process and we need to keep on knocking on doors and this law needs to come out from this committee. I'm very happy that Councilwoman Karen Koslovich is here. She's one of the co-sponsors and we need to get uh, some more and then get the speaker to give us a vote. So it's great that we're all here and we're testifying because well, there is some work still to be done, but it seems like we may get there. So I wanted to let you know that as far as the campaign is going, we had great coverage from a lot of media and that uh, we already got some positive answers from the Department of Cultural Affairs that included the Cabaret Law Repeal in the cultural plan that has been recently created and that the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment has been working with us uh, to uh, the nightlife, for the formation of the nightlife office. And um, of course, we need to, to say a great thanks to our charismatic, tireless ally in the city council, council member Espinal, who has been working and presenting these bills and giving us this opportunity to, you know, uh, address this historic wrong. So this is where we stand right now with the campaign. But uh, we, you know, we need to continue, so please do call your council members, get them to become co-sponsors of Bill Intro 1652. So in all these months, we've met with many council members, and uh, I wanted to let everybody know that not once has someone told us the cabaret law is good. The only arguments we heard for keeping it were either misinformation about safety and nuisance requirements that, as Max explained, as Max explained these issues are addressed in the building fire and noise codes, or worse, we heard that this very bad law that has been used to harm so many can be a useful tool against a few bad elements. You know, we need to have better, fairer laws, policies, and programs to address nightlife-related issues. Criminalizing social dancing for all New Yorkers cannot be the means to address a few bad nightlife uh, actors. So many people have fought these laws for many decades, and please do the right thing, repeal the cabaret law. Thank you. Hello. Um, hi, uh, my name is Frankie DeKaiser Hutchinson. Sorry, I'm doing this. 
Um, and also I want to say thank you City Council for having us here today. It's been um, a long journey and we've come leaps and bounds so it's you know important to celebrate the sort of things that we have achieved even though there's still a long way to go. Um, I represent the Dance Liberation Network and Disc Women. Um, I've lived in New York City since 2009 and like I just mentioned I'm one of the co-founders of Disc Women Platform and dedicated to progression in the music industry uh, particularly for women LGBTQ folks. Um, our work has been spotlighted and awarded uh, by Forbes, NPR, Call and Lord LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ Health Center for what we do to help center the experience of marginalized people in the artistic communities in New York City, as well as 15 other cities globally and other, over 200 artists. I mention this um, as I want it to be clear that I'm coming here um, as someone who works as an activist in these communities um, that are affected by cabaret law. Today, you know, I really want to ask why. Um, I want to ask the council members here today why. Why are we hanging on to a law that has been used historically and systema systematically to oppress black folks and other marginalized communities? It really begs the question, is this law being kept on the books as a tool of oppression that any administration can use and abuse as they please? It's dangerous. We've seen the impacts of its legacy during the Giuliani administration. With this law on the books, this kind of enforcement can easily be applied again. This law was introduced in 1926. Whilst there's apparently some skeptics as to whether this law was founded out of racism or not, this is America. If one understands how slavery to the state has an economical and visceral impact on black communities, then it isn't hard to understand how any legislation created in 1926 would also impact black communities. The law was introduced in this very room. The 1926 Alderman Report, which is officially enacted cabaret law, kicks off by specifically protesting jazz, a genre invented and overwhelmingly performed by African Americans, before stating, well, there has been altogether too much running wild in some of these nightclubs, and in the judgment of your committee, the wild stranger and the foolish native should have the check rein applied a little bit. It's crucial uh, to remember that jazz music is the reason why we're all here today. The music that is loved and adored and most importantly profited off. The irony that this genre was founded out of oppression and then folks were oppressed for playing it is astounding. The law didn't just affect patrons at jazz clubs, it later affected the musicians too who were forced to carry cabaret cards which would often be revoked, overwhelming effect, overwhelmingly affecting black musicians and left them unable to work. In addition, instrumentation was also limited, prohibiting use of brass and percussion instruments. So why is it City Council keeping this, law on the, is keeping this law in the toolbox exactly? If City Council claims it isn't using it, then what is its purpose of it? Everyone is uneasy with the arbitrary nature of the law founded on oppression. The fact that it's still here reveals how it's always been available to be used oppressively. Every day, I work with people. I work with people of color and LGBTQ communities who are convinced legal systems in New York City are built against their interest. This is one of those systems. We have an opportunity to break bread with people who feel disenfranchised, unlistened to, and, un and uncared about by city government. We have an opportunity to press the reset button and start afresh with how we treat those who we feel like they're being criminalized for freedom of expression and more specifically dancing. The city is being laughed at by other other city in the world for having a no dancing law. This is New York City, this is absurd, this needs to be repealed now. Thank you. Um, Ra Rachel, I'm going to keep you for the next panel. Okay. But I'm, going to I'm just going to um, just thank everyone for their testimonies. Um, Ms. Ellington, again, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here today. I think you, uh, with your history and the history of your family, uh, I'm sure that um, you are very aware, and I think you bring com uh, weight to this conversation. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. All right, thank you, guys. Thank you. So I would like to call up Rachel Nelson. Wally Rubin from Community Board 5, Andrew Riggi, and Robert Bookman from the New York City Hospitality Alliance. Hello. Uh, 
My name is Rachel Nelson. I'm here today on behalf of small business owners in Brooklyn. I own three bars, but I'm also here as a representative of somebody who's been a part of the New York City DIY scene for the last 15 years. Um, we come to you today not as a group of naive party people who think that things in politics happen overnight or that laws can be changed at a group's whim, but as a constituency of social activists, as a constituency of small business owners and artists, and as a constituency of taxpaying voting concerned citizens that see a flaw in our system that requires immediate remedy so that all people are treated equally under the law. It is illegal to dance in New York City, the city that never sleeps, where nightlife is a nine to ten billion dollar industry. I'll say it again, it is illegal to dance in New York City. Okay, not fully illegal. <laughs> it is illegal to dance without a cabaret license a license that only 1% of most, mostly wealthy-backed investor establishments are granted. 1%, that is 97 places, out of around 10,000 otherwise legally licensed establishments are allowed the privilege of dancing. Does this scenario of elitism resonate or surround familiar with another national dialogue? New York City is supposed to be a place where you come to make it, a city of neighborhoods where small businesses truly are the backbone of local economies. I spent 12 years working in New York City bars and restaurants while running an art space that has faced not only a 600% increase over 13 years, but also have had to move four times to spaces deeper and deeper into Brooklyn. For my pain, I have been accused of gentrifying or, and or displacing. But while my rents grow up, causing others perhaps less fortunate than me to do so too, photographs of my art space have been used literally on advertising and marketing campaigns for condos. Without my permission, I might add creating revenue and cultural cachet for the city at the cost of myself and other art spaces that have helped reshape New York City culture since the Giuliani era. The discussion about dancing is a part of a much bigger picture. It cuts at the very heart of which New York City we all want to live in, a place that rewards and values its small businesses and cultural spaces with fair laws that are enforced and granted equally, or at a city in which only chains and investors can afford the right to dance while exploiting cultural spaces and the little guys to see which neighborhoods are going to take off next. Recently, I've been lucky enough to find a landlord who was willing to give me a 10-year lease for my art space. Me and a group of dedicated friends invested our life savings in this space. We spent run months renovating and we did every job that we were legally allowed to do ourselves so that it still feels handmade and with love. And because we signed a lease six days after the deadly ghost ship fire, we, were e we even installed four exits in a room that is less than 1,100 square feet. We want to be safer than safe. But one thing, after all this time, money, and energy puts us in jeopardy, be jeopardy of being fined out of existence. Our customers like to dance. To this, I ask you, <laughs> has anyone here applied for a liquor license lately? Did you know that you get photographed, fingerprinted, your bank statements and personal his history are submitted to the State Liquor Authority. It's a 20-something page application. Then you need to apply for the Depart to Department of Health permit to incorporate through the Department of State and the federal law. You register your business with the IRS. You have to file a certificate for the honor of collecting taxes. You go to community board meetings. You have insurance for workers' compensation, disability, liability, and liquor liability, not to mention Department of Buildings, local fire code, establishing relationships with your local precinct, and I promise you, whatever the laws don't require of you, your commercial insurance carrier will, including video surveillance and license security. So yes, it is a true privilege to hold a liquor license and to run a nightlife venue in this space. It comes with a lot of responsibility, but what is curious is that we are granted all this grave responsibility to serve and watch over people who are consuming alcohol. We establish and pay for the creation of trust between the state and ourselves. But somehow, the simple act of dancing we are not trusted with. To this concern, I'm often told the cabaret lot is not in force. To this, I tell you, come out to Brooklyn or Queens on a Friday night around 1 AM when an unknown, unregulated paramilitary enforcement agency known as March raids your place, shut down, shuts down, and frightens customers away from ever coming back, often triggered by something as small as a complaint made three months ago by a neighbor who was already forgotten. One of their favorite tools of intimidation, especially when you are otherwise up to code, is a fine for illegal dancing, a violation of the cabaret law. So yes, it is enforced. It is enforced arbitrarily, often against minority-owned and small venues. When you receive a cabaret violation, that is a dancing violation, you may not be able to renew your liquor license. You may never be able to open another place. It is not a small thing. 
Dancing puts small business owners in constant fear for ourselves and the livelihood of the many people that we employ. And let me reassure you, we employ a lot of people. There are concerns that repealing the cabaret law will lead to a surge in new bars. But nothing about repealing the cabaret law will change any of the things I mentioned before. That is, it will be just as hard and just as bureaucratically tedious and just as expensive to open a bar. For this, the status quo will remain intact, and neighborhoods with few bars can breathe a sigh of relief. For those of us open, already open or hoping to open, it will clear away some of the red tape and fear in doing business. So with this said today, we come here today, not naively, to wipe away in one swoop a law steeped in racism and bias against minority and small business owners. There, there is a call to eradicate any such inequity from our books. We do come here today with our eyes wide open to a long-term relationship and to a process. We come here today as a nightlife constituency that I might add paid almost a billion dollars in sales tax last year to ask the city council and the de Blasio administration to take the first step by repealing the cabaret law which will start the process by decriminalizing dancing in New York City. And yes, we are prescient of the fact that decriminalization is not the same as legalization, but we'd like to f for dancing to be at least as legal as other things the city has deemed not worthy of enforcing anymore. Thank you. Good, right. Good afternoon and thank you for allowing Manhattan Community Board 5 to address you today on the issue of revoking the cabaret, New York City cabaret law. We strongly urge the council to be mindful of the important tools that the cabaret law gives to communities around the city. Manhattan Community Board 5 is located in the central business district of Manhattan, yet increasingly we are a residential community as well. CB5 has had tremendous success in recent years working with our partners at the SLA, the DCA, the NYPD, and members of the public to maintain a necessary public review process for cabaret license applicants in our district. The New York City cabaret law has been a critical component of this process. It has ensured that standards of public safety and quality of life are met by making certain that venues are appropriately constructed with adequate life safety protections, that operators are qualified, and that proposed methods of operation are appropriately balanced with the needs of the local community. More importantly, it has afforded us an opportunity to bring nightlife applicants into a public hearing process with a clear set of expectations, where residents and neighbors can weigh in to express their concerns or show their support, and through our auspices, come to collaborative agreements that work for all parties. We have concerns about whether the recently created Office of Nightlife, under the jurisdiction of the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, has the proper experience to play this role. MOMI has traditionally and predominantly been the proponent and advocate for media industries within New York City government, which is its proper role. It cannot substitute, however, for a community board process within which nightlife applicants must directly address their prospective neighbors. Film and television production comes and goes. Nightlife venues are part of their community night after night. Manhattan Community Board 5 hopes this committee will proceed cautiously regarding changes to the New York City Cabaret Law, always keeping in mind the valued and necessary role community boards currently play to balance the concerns of this important industry with those local residents and neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move forward, I just want to address um, an important point about the, the Office of Nightlife, right? The Office of Nightlife is an office that will be just accessible to the community boards that it is going to be to the businesses, and it's going to be representative of all parties and all stakeholders when it comes to nightlife and communities. So um, I, don't, I wouldn't want the community boards to see this as a way to um, hinder quality of lives in communities, but it's more about opening a dialogue between the community board, the city, and, and the businesses in the community. So it's, it's, it's designed to help everyone in a way where we value and look for ways to help the nighttime economy grow at the same time. So, you know, you're, you're part of the conversation, the community boards are part of the conversation, business is part of the conversation, and you all will have equal weight in whatever is being said or done in the future. Good afternoon. 
Uh, my name is Andrew Riggi. I am the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We are a not-for-profit trade association that represents thousands of eating and drinking establishments throughout the five boroughs. Now, many of our members are impacted by the cabaret law, which requires restaurants, bars, and clubs to meet specific zoning, safety requirements, and also then obtain a license from the city's Department of Consumer Affairs before they're permitted to allow dancing within their establishment. Now, as been said here today, the history of the cabaret law is very controversial, and its enforcement has certainly been uh, described as racist and selective. Uh, over the years, uh, the courts have rightfully struck down many provisions of the cabaret law as unconstitutional. So what we have today is really a skeleton of the original, much more controversial law that acts almost as a checklist to ensure that other zoning uh, and public safety requirements are adhered to uh, before uh, dancing is permitted. Nonetheless, repealing the cabaret law, or I should say the license, is an important action and a symbolic step for many people, as you've heard here today. Uh, however, upon repeal of the cabaret license, the New York City Hospitality Alliance urges the city to advise businesses and the public that such a repeal does not mean that people can now just dance at every restaurant, bar, club, or other venue around the city. To allow dancing, a business is still going to have to meet the proper zoning requirements, have the proper public assembly permit, have video cameras and fire safety systems, and if they employ security guards, they must meet additional standards. When all of these requirements are met, the business will then need to amend their liquor license to permit dancing in their licensed establishment. Now, because of this multi-step process, uh, as it often is for the business community, we believe that the Office of Nightlife, which we commend you on, congratulate everyone that uh, can do a lot of work around this issue and begin addressing the public safety, the zoning requirements in a really comprehensive and thoughtful way to ensure that we can allow dancing at more establishments around the city, which generates revenue for business, allows people to go out, dance, and enjoy themselves, and gets rid of the blemish of the history of this law. Um, now, we also want to just say uh, and make sure that the record reflects that prior to this hearing, we have uh, expressed concern on the current language contained in intro 1652, and we do appreciate you and the team's uh, responsiveness and openness to address uh, these concerns because we do not want them to have negative and unintended consequences uh, on the nightlife community and our city's culture. So we really look forward to working with you to make sure that this bill is done in a uh, straightforward, effective way. And then again, we think the Office of Nightlife can really work in a comprehensive way to look at this and all of the issues that impact nightlife, the nighttime economy. So uh, thank you, and I'll turn it over to our counsel, Rob Bookman. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Bookman. I'm an attorney uh, in the city of New York. Uh, I, uh, I'm counsel and one of the founders of the Hospitality Alliance and uh, a partner in the law firm Bozetsky and Bookman we specialize in the hospitality industry. And while I am nowhere near as famous as the granddaughter of Duke Ellington, I did want to spend a minute giving you my background so you know where I come from on this issue. Um, I uh, helped form the New York Cabaret Association back in 1989 after I left city government in 86 for the sole purpose of trying to address the unfairness of the cabaret law. Uh, that expanded that New York Cabaret Association into the New York Nightlife Association back in 1994, and that remained in full force and effect until five years ago when we formed the New York City Hospitality Alliance. Uh, I have been at the forefront of this issue for literally 30 years. I worked with Council Member Kozlowitz about 20 some odd years ago in uh, legislation to try to liberalize the cabaret law to allow more places. We, we, I think we, the definition we came up then, uh, Councilwoman, was uh, incidental dancing so that local neighborhood bars could do it when they weren't really dance clubs. There was no political uh, desire for it at the time. So it, it simply didn't go anywhere. I think Giuliani was mayor at the time. Uh, but that's my background. So. We are huge supporters of lawful and safe dancing and would support any bill that would increase the number of places where uh, businesses can offer dancing legally as long as it is in a safe environment. New York City, because of two major tragedies over the decades, uh, the Happy Land and the Blue Angel, uh, in which uh, 
unlicensed, unsafe establishments were operating as dance clubs, had fire tragedies. New York passed what we consider the toughest and sanest, well, the toughest safety laws in the world. So when you walk into a licensed dance club today, you know that they have met the toughest safety standards for any place in the world. Um, and we think that's important and we shouldn't lose that because God forbid there's another incident, the pendulum's gonna swing completely in the opposite direction. I don't think anybody you know, wants to lose that. The problem you know, I have you know, with this bill is that you repeal the cabaret law today and tomorrow not one additional place that currently cannot have dancing will be able to have dancing. Let me repeat, since a number of th people like to repeat a headline here. Repealing the cabaret law does not increase by one establishment the number of places where dancing can legally occur. And by the way, dancing is not criminal and the people who dance are not violating laws. We're talking about businesses who are regulated and how the city and the state chooses to regulate those businesses. And that's because the cabaret law in my old agency, the Department of Consumer Affairs, they didn't, it doesn't decide where people could dance where businesses can allow dancing. It simply acts as a checklist to ensure that the business has all of those requirements that are otherwise required, so that it meets the zoning requirements, uh, that it meets the fire safety codes, and it meets the building codes. And when you have all those items are checked, you get your cabaret license, it's as of right. There's no, no discretion. What this bill does is remove the checklist, but it keeps all the items that are on the checklist and it doesn't change any of them. One of the attorneys in the first panel correctly testified that zoning laws is what determines where dancing can occur and not occur, and repealing the cabaret law doesn't change that. And while the cabaret law over the decades appropriately has been found more and more unconstitutional, leaving now only patron dancing is the only thing that the Department of Consumer Affairs insists on a cabaret license for, um, the zoning laws became more and more expansive and restrictive about where you can have dancing. So that's where the battle ultimately needs to take place, is at city planning as to where they're going to allow businesses you know, to dance you know, and to have dance clubs. Uh, then, of course, you have the fire safety issues. Uh, I've sat in many meetings with the fire department, and they will tell you, as they have told us, and I know they told Councilmember Kozowitz you know, over the years, that uh, a patron's awareness of their surroundings and therefore safety laws need to be different for a, a bar where you're sitting and having a beer and talking with a friend, uh, a restaurant where you're having a meal versus a nightclub where there's a dance floor, where the music tends to be louder, where the lights tend to be lower. And because you're not as aware of your surroundings, that's why they have all of these safety laws. So what we're worried about is that a mixed message will go out uh, to all these businesses in Brooklyn and elsewhere that the reason why they don't have cabaret licenses now is because they're probably not zoned for it because if they were they could go get a cabaret license. Uh, we're concerned that there's going to be a confusing message out there that the dance laws have been thrown out, the dance police are out of business, it's okay now for every neighborhood bar on a Friday or Saturday night to push the tables and chairs away, bring in a DJ, put a red, line, a red velvet rope outside, charge $10 and be a dance club. That's a bad message and if that's what is the result of this because there's going to be more legal enforcement from the police, not less as a result of that because people will be complaining to their council members and otherwise that that nice bar downstairs is now a, you know, some loud club on the weekends and they will use whatever tools they can and they don't need a cabaret law to issue violations to a place like that. They will issue violations, which we defend in my office all the time, for operating contrary to the CFO or if they have more than 75 people in there, you don't have a public assembly permit, um, or that you don't have the fire safety. Or my nightmare scenario is, God forbid, there's a fire in one of these places and people get killed. And, and, then, they, and then they're gonna turn to city government and say, well, you told us it's okay. You said the dance laws don't exist anymore. So if you're gonna do this, you gotta be very clear that it's step one in a long process and nothing has changed other than there's one less law they could write a ticket under. But if the police are coming to a place in, you know, now, they're not coming because of a complaint of dancing inside, I assure you. They're coming because there are complaints of other issues, and they use the dancing as something to issue a ticket for. They will still issue this, the ticket if people are dancing there because it's violating three, four or other different zoning and fire safety laws. So that's our concern, and we, want, and we know we've expressed that to you. 
As to the other language, I'm a little concerned that you, well, we, if we're going to repeal this law, we don't exchange, and the number, everybody has a different number. I understand there's 175 licensed cabarets left. Uh, some of the numbers today, you know, people stated were less. But let's even use the larger number, 175. I don't want to exchange the security camera you know, requirements, which are, not, which are not inexpensive for a small neighborhood business. Uh, I don't want to exchange 175 places that have to install that for hundreds or maybe thousands of places who meet this new definition of this new thing called nightlife establishment. So we want to continue working with you because I, I don't think anybody's looking to add more burdens to these local businesses who, who now still can't dance, but now they have to have security cameras because of, you know, they, they meet this new definition of nightlife establishment. Uh, so let's work together on language. And by the way, the police love security cameras. If they could require every business in the city of New York to have security cameras inside and out, they would. So I'm not surprised that the administration says, you know, well, you know, we're not, they didn't give you a clean answer to your insightful question. You know, would you support language that only limited security cameras to the 175 places that are currently required to have them? And they kind of gave you an answer that sounded like to me, well, we're going to capture some more places. I don't think that that would be fair. So those are the issues that we have. We, we appreciate working with you on this, and we will continue to work with you on it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to say, for the record, I agree with you. I wouldn't want more than 175 of those businesses beyond that to be captured um, under a, a new bill. So we're going to work towards that. That's great. Um, I guess my next question to you is, if we repeal the cabaret law, the businesses within the zoning that you've mentioned earlier, where they need a license for people to dance? They won't need a license to dance, no. Okay. It, but they'll, they'll still need everything else. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's, right. that's, the, that's the point, making sure we have the security in there for that to happen. They'll still, they'll, if they're in the zone, they won't need a license. They'll just have to install, if they don't already, they'll have to install all the safety systems, which the fire code requires for dancing. Um, and they will most likely have to go back to the state liquor authority uh, and step one would be the community board and what's called the change in method of operation application. Because they clearly, when they filed, they filed as a bar with no dancing because the, the SLA license application says, if you could check yes to dancing in New York City, you have to give us a cabaret license. So they clearly check no that they're not having dancing. So if they're going to have dancing because they're zoned for it, um, they're going to have to do that. But they're also going to have to change their CFO. Just because you're in a zone for it doesn't mean you can legally do what that zone allows for. CFOs are per building and per floor. So, so the cabaret li license is that first step. In cabaret law license was the last step. The first step was your CFO. But I'm saying, re removing the, the cabaret license is that first step, and then they can go back and start worrying about you're repealing the top of the of the uh, of the pyramid not all the things that left to, led to the top of the pyramid when I, I did many cabaret licenses but legislatively as as a city council member the the only action I can take is to repeal the cabaret law in order to start that transaction of, well, of allowing have, for people some, to be able to dance in the use groups without a license right you and you have okay. some input all right thank, thanks you, you certainly thanks. have input the council has a, <laughs> thanks, has thanks, a strong bro. zone I have a question for Rachel I want to get right they have a strong zoning all right role. Rachel, um, you, you have a very uh, colorful history in, in Brooklyn and, and in the city. Um, as you mentioned before, you ran a lot of DIY venues. Um, some that I'm very familiar with are, are some that were in the manufacturing areas in Williamsburg. Um, possibly you know or you have acquaintances that, that run some in the manufacturing areas in Bushwick. Um, would you uh, say that you've seen venues close in Williamsburg and possibly Bushwick because um, they didn't have a license to allow dancing in that. It's often a tactic of various administrations and the local law enforcement that when a neighborhood is under uh, rapid gentrification, they start to use the cabaret law to uh, quickly evict people from spaces. So yes, it's something that's been used uh, over the last 20 years. I've seen it numerous amounts of times in order to get lower paying tenants out and getting higher paying tenants or redevelopment for condos in. And use group 12, have there been DIY spaces? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, the entire cabaret. Kent Avenue in Williamsburg was all, I believe, use group 12 was all industrial. I mean, those condos are sitting on things that used to be garbage dumps. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, guys, we're going to work together very, very strongly to make sure that we um, 
protect uh, other businesses from being captured into this law. Correct. I think it's something I strongly agree with you, and uh, I look forward to continuing the dialogue after this hearing. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Your pleasure to work with. You too, man, always. Thanks. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Christopher Carroll from Local 802, the American Federation of Musicians, Greg Miller of Dance Parade, James Burkhart from New York City Artist Coalition, John Barclay from Dance Liberation Network, And we're going to set the clock for two minutes. <clears throat> when you're ready, you can, you can begin testifying. Good afternoon, Chair Espinal and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs. Uh, my name is Christopher Carroll, and I'm the political director for the Associated Musicians of Greater New York Local 802 AFM. It's on? Great, thank you. Um, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present testimony in support of the full repeal of the cabaret law. Uh, as this law has no place in our society, and if New York City is to remain a place that supports the arts and creativity, as well as the businesses and performers that make New York City a cultural capital, uh, it must be repealed. Local 802 is the largest local union of professional musicians in the world. We uh, include musicians of all styles and backgrounds, from the Metropolitan Opera and Orchestra, to Broadway and the thousands of musicians playing in recording studios, jazz clubs, hotels, bars, lounges, dance halls. Uh, they perform each day and every night. Musicians come to New York from across the country and the globe for the opportunity to perform with the most talented artists and be part of the most creative community. Many of these musicians perform in our city's nightlife venues and it is here in those venues that much of our vibrant artistic and cultural life is born, developed, and encouraged. As a result, New York City is home not only to the most talented musicians in the world, but also to the most innovative, the most diverse, the most flexible, and the most creative. However, the cabaret law, a law steeped in both racism and bigotry, is arbitrarily enforced, limits in performers' freedom of expression, hinders the health of small businesses and venues, and diminishes our city's identity as a cultural and entertainment capital. It runs contrary to the values that New Yorkers hold dear, the values of inclusion, the values of compassion, values of acceptance and artistic freedom. This undue and unreasonable burden is not just felt by the business owners forced to comply or risk liability. It is felt by the musicians whose livelihoods depend on the performing live music at a restaurant or at a bar or in a nightclub. Local 82 advocates every day for the creation of performance opportunities that encourage live music and allow musicians to be treated fairly and support themselves and their families. These types of opportunities are vitally important, both for the vibrancy of our city's cultural identity, as well as the health of our, our, our entertainment economy. Musicians are subject to frequent exploitation, misclassification, or infrequent economically sustainable opportunities for employment. As a result, the median income for musicians in the five boroughs is just $30,000 a year. Repressive laws that deny musicians crucial opportunities to they need to continue to live and work in our city must be abolished. Ultimately, the city, can, the city and the council must leverage every opportunity to create laws and regulations to support the musicians, performers who make New York City a cultural capital of the world. Local 802 is proud to, work, to support the Office of Nightlife, the advisory uh, board, under the stewardship and leadership of uh, Councilmember Espinal in August, and we hope the new office will provide the administrative and regulatory support musicians need to thrive. The abolishment of the cabaret law is an important component of those efforts. And the musicians of our city fully support its immediate repeal. Thank you. My name is Greg Miller. I'm the executive director of Dance Parade um, and a member of LegalizedDance.org. Uh, we actually started the Dance Parade um, in 2007 as a result of a state Supreme Court case where a number of dancers um, uh, brought a case that said 
dancing should be, be legal in all the venues. Um, and we were shocked to hear that all kinds of social dancing, Latin ballroom, country, western, and many more, might be considered um, not expressive under the, even when we had the First Amendment. Uh, we responded with the dance parade, uh, not just on Broadway, but in uh, schools and community centers, senior centers. We bring dance programs uh, that culminate in the final event in May. Um, and uh, we now have 80 unique styles of dance. Um, and all these people, they originally came out because of the cabaret law. And um, I'm going to go off script here and kind of respond a bit to the Hospitality Alliance and some of the community board opposition to the law. Uh, I think it's kind of a scare tactic to say that there's going to be discos popping up everywhere, <laughs> that, that um, the fire safety is an issue. Because when, when it did happen, uh, the, the Happy Land fire, for example, um, you know, in the Bronx was an unregulated space. Um, it, it was gang related. It happened, you know, because there weren't safe conditions. Now we have the safe conditions. We have a 2007 Noise Reduction Act where the council passed uh, the law to make the city quieter. So a lot of the issues that we're talking about today that scare people about, about repeal have already been covered by existing laws. So I just wanted to say that and I question you know, what about corruption? This is 1926 when this law occurred. Um, when did the corruption stop? We all knew it happened, but did it actually stop? There's 104 licenses. Um, and I just want to, like, have everybody look at the list and, and ask ourselves, you know, do we need to investigate why some clubs get them and others don't? Very famous large clubs don't have them, and we don't want to cause problems for them. We want to have dancing for everybody, um, but let's look at you know where the money is, or um, you know try to come up with a fair way. So I want to thank you for so much for the task force. I think it's a great step that's going to assist the not in my backyard argument, and uh, it's going to make a huge difference. We're going to have a better city because of this. Right now, culture is going away, and we need your help, the committee's help, to make this a better city. Thank you. My name is Jamie Burkhart. I'm a member of the New York City Artist Coalition. I'm asking New York City Council to repeal the cabaret law. The cabaret law makes social dancing illegal in all but fewer than 100 places in New York City. I'm talking about birthday dancing. I'm talking about the first dance at a wedding. At a wedding, we should all dance. Dance is how we express the unity of our families becoming one. Dance is how we move our cultural traditions forward across generations. Dance should not be illegal, nor should it jeopardize our city's vital community places, which we're already losing due to the affordability crisis. The cabaret law was created in 1926 to stop interracial dancing in Harlem jazz clubs. It was used by Mayor Giuliani in the 90s to target and shutter gay bars, decimating culture. Stonewall was the only gay bar at the time to allow dancing, in spite of not having a cabaret license. The civil rights issue law was used time and time again and it's still on the books, and its prejudicial history is still felt today. Because of the cabaret law, there are zero legal places to dance in Bed-Stuy nor El Barrio, for instance. There are zero cabaret licenses in Councilmember Cumbo's district, where I live, nor in the Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito's district. With fewer than 100 active cabaret licenses in all five boroughs, there's nowhere legal to dance in the vast majority of New York City's neighborhood. It, walking in today, Councilmember Drum just told me that they never grant cabaret licenses for LGBTQ spaces in his district. In 2017, we as a city must take a clear stand against racism and homophobia. This tool of discrimination from another time has no place in our civil society. My life as an advocate began with the loss of another. My good friend, Nick Gomez Hall. He was one of the 36 people killed in the ghost ship tragedy earlier this year. From the minute I heard he was missing, I knew he was gone. They all were. I was filled with shock, then grief. My first response was to organize for safety of community spaces, and I soon found myself in league with longtime safety advocates in the arts. 
We facilitated fire safety walkthroughs and workshops. Our study groups for the fire department's fire guard certification exam have a 100% pass rate. Working directly with spaces, we found that though they were up to code and ready for inspection, some were afraid to engage with the fire department because they knew they did not have a cabaret license. The fire department doesn't care about if you have a cabaret license because the cabaret law has nothing to do with life safety. For those who claim the cabaret law is about safety, we know what makes community spaces safe, and it is not a ban on dancing. Improve the relationship of trust to save lives. Repeal the cabaret law. For those who say that the cabaret law is not being enforced, many spaces cited in the, it is. Many spaces cited in the last year have closed. The cabaret law is an easy way for extreme conservative groups to ex arbitrarily shut down spaces. Since the presidential election, there have been targeted alt-right attacks against community spaces in New York City. Through the internet, they incite others with their political views to anonymously call authorities on art spaces which they see as liberal organizing centers. They posted my home address on their website. At least one space I know of was visited by authorities. A teenage prankster in Wyoming can shut down spaces in New York City with this outdated law. Repeal the cabaret law. Legalize dance. Don't ask, don't tell isn't good enough. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Barclay. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for coming out. Uh, real quickly, I want to just address uh, a few of the comments made by the uh, gentlemen that were defending the New York City cabaret no dancing law in uh, 2017. Uh, he mentioned the, uh, the, zoning, uh, the zoning issue. And uh, I just want to reiterate that we are, all of us advocates, including Mr. Espinal, are uh, very aware of the uh, zoning changes that need to be made and we are uh, working on them, 100%. In regards to the uh, camera requirements, uh, the, the fear of a, uh, a venue with, let's say, 150 capacity now has to have uh, cameras outside. I have, uh, I have a small bar with a uh, 141 capacity. I also had a restaurant with uh, around uh, 50 capacity. And for both of those, we were required by um, our commercial insurance to already have those. So almost every place nowadays, coffee shops, everything, is, uh, is putting up cameras. You also get a, uh, a uh, it's like a public safety officer, community affairs officer that come by, and that's part of the, the recommendation that goes along with uh, the uh, community board recommendation. So that's, uh, in, in my, personal belief already very much covered and I don't see that as being uh, a uh, you know a burden to uh, to small businesses as a small business owner so yes my name is John Barclay I have a decade of experience in New York City nightlife I'm well versed on the cabaret law the cabaret license application process I can speak at length regarding ca contemporary enforcement which I believe to be discriminatory to say the least I'm currently, amongst other things, a New York City bar manager who has repeatedly been negatively affected by the cabaret law, and I support a full repeal of the law, which I believe is absurd, antiquated, racist, dangerous, and extremely embarrassing for our city. I currently operate a modestly sized bar that in its five years of harmonious existence has had literally zero noise complaints, is in good graces with our local precinct and community board, Zero insurance, zero insurance claims and exist peacefully with our neighbors. We have a certificate of occupancy, a place of assembly, emergency lighting, several egresses, regularly inspected fire extinguishers, and a health rating for whatever that's worth. We employ licensed and insured security guards who are also certified fire guards. We are conveniently situated on the same block as our fire station. We have passed dozens and dozens of FDNY, DOB, SLA, DOH and NYPD inspections, yet we live in constant fear and paranoia of our city government. A few years ago, we received a single cabaret citation, which resulted in appearances and fines in both criminal and state court here in New York City. We were told by the city and the state liquor authority that if we continue to allow dancing, we would be shut down. My government has repeatedly told me they will pull my liquor license 
and that my business and the livelihood of myself and my 15 employees will cease to exist, all for allowing dancing. This has been happening for 91 years now. Bars are raided, fined, and shut down. Nights are ruined, money is lost. Yet for 91 years, New York City still dances. You can embarrass New Yorkers, you can bankrupt them, and you can injure them, but New York City will never stop dancing. No law, no agency, no military occupation will ever come close. When you push New Yorkers out of bars, they dance in warehouses. If you shut down the warehouses, they will dance in the subways, in the sewers, in City Hall. You cannot stop them, you can only shuffle them around. The incredible dance music of New York City, disco, salsa, hip hop, freestyle, it feels like it's appreciated by everyone in the world except for our city government. The same institution who brags about its cultural contrib contributions routinely oppresses the contributors. Council members of the cultural capital of the world, please take this opportunity to decriminalize social dancing. It's harmless, it's healthy, it's beautiful, and it's ingrained in the complex and incredible identity of this city. I'm happy to answer any questions regarding my professional and personal experiences with the cabaret law. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much all for your testimony. And Jamie, thank you for sharing your personal story. I'm sure it's tough, but I um, appreciate your advocacy on behalf of your friends and, and the city. Thank you. Um, Chris, Chris, uh, you represent the musicians of the city? Uh, that's right. We're the unionized musicians, but we, uh, we make a point of uh, being legislatively and politically active for every musician in the city, regardless of whether or not they're in our union. And, you, and uh, the union believes that um, repealing the cabaret law and allowing for nightlife to flourish will create more opportunities for, for those musicians and artists? It is important to our union, both for the job creation components, but also for the signal that it's sending, uh, to your point. The signal the, uh, the city government is sending to our culturally uh, active arts community uh, about what, do we prioritize arts, do we prioritize culture, do we see it as part of being a New Yorker? No, we appreciate your, your advocacy and support on this. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Um, John, you, you mentioned that, that uh, currently, uh, to, in order to receive insurance for your business, commercial insurance, that there is a requirement for cameras? Uh, yeah, I mean, or it, in or my helps. personal experience, absolutely. So, so I don't know if every insurance company, and I don't know how that varies venue to venue, but um, I think uh, most business owners would agree that it would be very uh, hard to operate, especially a large capacity venue, to have insured um, uh, without security cameras. Okay, hundred percent. You you do have. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, um, do you have any any businesses within Use Group 12 that you're part I of? I don't. Or it's bar uh, almost no bars and restaurants exist in the city within Use Group 12. Do um, Do you have any acquaintances that or? Oh, uh, I, I actually I can't believe I just said that. I I actually do have a lease <laughs> on a building that is within Use Group 12. I'm working with some people. We are trying to uh, obtain a cabaret license. Uh, we have not opened yet. Um, but the reason we chose that, and it's in a, it's in a sanitation uh, district, um, is because it's one of the only areas in North Brooklyn where uh, a license is uh, obtainable. If you don't have a cabaret license, that means people cannot dance in your, in that venue, correct? Correct. Place. I mean, the, the, that venue does not exist yet, and maybe yeah. it never will, but if it did, that would be, that would be accurate. So you, you would need a license in order for people to dance? A hundred percent. If we repeal the cabaret law, will you need a license for people to dance in Use Group 12? It, it sounds like no. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. I, I, I encourage repeal, <laughs> just to set the record straight. <laughs> All right, guys, I appreciate it. Thank you, Greg, also for all your advocacy. I know you've, you've been part of this fight for, for decades. Uh, just a note, too. Half of the existing licenses aren't even in use group 12. Just saying. <laughs> so yeah. it, it's ineffective, totally ineffective law. The licensing is half of the 104 licenses that exist now are not in use group 12. Do you, do you have any data to show that? No? Um, we'll get it to you. A lot of those have been grandfathered in because that the um, the zoning thing was was not part of the original law. 
So there's a lot of spaces that have been uh, around uh, for a long time. That, yeah, that, that is accurate. Have kept actually, the, the, actually, in my district, we do have a business that's been grandfathered in, and they're able to obtain a cabaret license, even though they're not in Unit sure. 12. They're in actually yeah. in a residential commercial area. So, you're, yeah, that's, that's Yeah, it's accurate. possible there's another reason that some of these exist for sure, um, but some of them are, are grandfathered in, and the zoning thing is definitely something that was put there ex post facto, in my opinion, to discourage dancing in the city. All right. All right. Great. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to try to stick to the clock. Uh, that way we can all leave by 5. Um, I mean, I can stay past 5, but I'm, I'm just, just saying. <laughs> um, we have Conrad Neblet, Matt Arsickley, and again, um, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your names, uh, Robert uh, Blumenblatt, Jonah Levy. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please forgive me this panel. I actually had uh, another panel that I that I kept aside. Um, but you'll, you'll be next after the next group. I have Justin Carter and Kevin Dugan from New York State Restaurant Association. Kevin, Kevin Dugan? He left? Okay, so Kevin's not here, all right. I'm going to call back the other guys. <laughs> Conrad Neblet, Matt Arsick, Arsickley, Robert Blumenblatt. Justin, you may begin whenever you're ready. Okay. Yeah. Um, check. There we go. Good. Okay. Oh, thanks for having me. My name is Robert Blumenblatt, and I'm a resident of Manhattan. I'm privileged to be a friend of Greg Miller, with whom I work to organize the dance parade. I'm retired. My hearing is not as good as it used to be, but I can still dance. And I tell you, living in New York City is a privilege. And dancing, as I want to remind everyone, is a fundamental human experience. I am surprised to learn today for the first time that the Supreme Court ruled that dancing is not a constitutional right. I find that surprising, and I bet none of the judges are good dancers. <laughs> so I might, I'm even thinking of the <coughs> possibility of trying to amend the Constitution to make dancing a right that all Americans have. We will be the first dancing nation in the world who has its own constitutional amendment that permits dancing. Anyway, uh, I want to make another observation. Living in the city, being an immigrant, coming here at the age of 10, I had the privilege of attending City College in 1965. And one of the things I noticed when I was attending, is that in one ballroom where I used to go were the kids dancing rock, rock and roll when you could only show Elvis Presley up to his waist. And when I left to the next auditorium, by the way, my mother was a natural ballerina and she was top in the class as, as she was a high school student in Europe. So I must have developed that sense for my mother. At any rate, uh, I went to the next auditorium where I noticed African Americans. This is 1965. The music was different, anyone could go, and I was the only white teenager who was in that room, and I said, this is the way I want to learn to dance. <laughs> and I've been doing that all my life. Now, two days ago, I attended the ballroom where I know for years 
After 12 o'clock, you can dance there. I don't know if it's legal or not. I didn't <laughs> ask. But I go there. It so happens at my age, because I'm such a great dancer, I had the most fun. I even had a young lady asking me to party with me. I said, I'm probably too old for you. She says, no, but we can party together. So let me remind you, if you're dancing, you're not going to drink so much because when you drink, you're sloppy on the dance floor and the ladies won't look at you. You understand? But it's a great thing for, for men and women. And being a man, I tell you, if you're good on the dance floor, you don't have to ask a woman to dance with you. She will come and say, I want to be with that guy, and she will strategically be there. The young guys, unfortunately, are too aggressive, don't understand that. So anyway, I think our judicial system, by the way, my field is also philosophy and history. So it's, I want to remind you that 1688 was the glorious revolution. What that means, it was glorious in England, but the Puritans came to the United States, and the Puritans invented the idea that anything having to do with nature and sex is dirty. That's the problem we have. African Americans, one fortunate thing, they did not experience this kind of thing in the stripping of their culture. They preserved their music and their dancing in churches. And so naturally, African Americans ad ad excel in dance and music. This is part of our American culture. And it was in 1926, I believe it's true, the real reason to prohibit dancing is racist. Because the culture that supports dancing is a dancing culture. Do you know the English as being dancing? Of course, the Beatles made the exception, right? <laughs> but anyway, I want to sum up, and I wanna, I'm going to tell you this. I live at Waterside Plaza. And I'm not very political, but I will look at the councilmen that support this bill and those that are against it. I'm surprised Garodnik is not on the list. And I will tell everyone at Waterside Plaza who supports dancing and who does it. We have a venue there where people can get up and dance, and they have it every month. But I don't know if it's legal, you know? Thank you. thank you for your time, and I think you're the chairman who supports it. I'm glad to meet you. and I, I'm glad to meet you, too, and thanks for the dancing advice. I'm sorry, advice. I can't hear I'm going to put it to use this weekend, for sure. Can you hear it? Oh, uh, he said thank <laughs> I, you. He said thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's go back to Justin. I know you yeah. were starting. Okay. Yeah. So my name is Justin Carter. Um, I'm a musician. I'm one of the owners of an outdoor and soon to open indoor uh, place in Ridgewood called Nowadays. And um, I'm one of the resident DJs and founders of two parties based here in New York called Mr. Sunday and Mr. Saturday Night. Um, I'm here today as one of very few fortunate business owners with a lease on a space that is actually zoned for cabaret. Um, and we've got all the work done to be compliant with the law. So as a business owner, I don't really have a horse in the race here. But the repeal of cabaret is about more than business, which is why I'm, I'm still here. Um, I have this friend I met here in New York at a club on the Lower East Side. His name is Andrew. And he grew up in Richmond. <clears throat> and he grew up in an unofficially but still very segregated neighborhood that was full of Confederate monuments and right down the street from the Confederate White House. And lucky for Andrew, he had a really cool aunt who didn't really fit in with the family and she moved down to New Orleans. And when Andrew was growing up, uh, he would visit her every now and then. And on one of those visits, she took him to a party. And it was the first time he'd ever really been in the casual company of people who didn't look more or less the same as him. But when he tells this story, he doesn't talk about how different he felt or how foreign the experience was. He remembers that there was a band playing and that he started dancing. And he looked around the room at all the other people there, many of whom he had nothing visibly in common with. And he saw that they were enjoying themselves in the same way that he was. 
They were all dancing together. And that was the experience that began to break down the false barriers of difference in his life. <clears throat> having the cabaret law on the books in New York City keeps people from having this kind of experience for no clear, no good reason. And the last thing we need right now are barriers to understanding each other. Many people here today have spoken about the financial hardships imposed by cabaret. I could go on about those because we're at the end of the process. They're kind of gone now for me. Um, there's selective enforcement that many people have spoken about, the redundancy of the law that are built in, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, I printed out my, my statement here, um, which I can, can give to you. Um, for now, I'll just leave you with a request that you do everything that you can to get this law uh, passed, get cabaret repealed, and thank you very much for everything that you've done. Thank you. Uh, my name is Conrad Nebelet, and I live in Harlem. Um, I'm asking you guys to, uh, appealing to you guys to repeal uh, this unjust law. Um, the, my father was born in 1916 in Harlem, and so he was affected by this law. And he went to the Renaissance and places that uh, Mercedes uh, father performed at. And so this law has affected three generations in my family, my grandmother, my her, her son, my father, and myself. Um, for me, this is an issue of, it leaves me with a question of how can social dancing be illegal? To me, it's unjust, it doesn't make sense. Uh, social dancing is a form of expression that you get to release and let go if you're dealing with stress. And I'm a social dancer. I'm also a performer, and I'm also uh, a producer of a dance party called Together in Spirit. And I've been doing it since 1996, providing a nurturing environment for people to release and let go on the dance floor. And over the years, it gets harder and harder to find a place to provide together in spirit. And it's a very, um, the type of music is soulful house music. It's very peaceful. People, you know, there was one point we didn't even have a security guard. Um, and it, you know, I, it really is time to, to, for the city I say, is to be in alignment with what people need. You know, we're really in very trying times, and releasing and dancing is a good thing. And it supports, you know, when people go out to dance, it supports other businesses like restaurants and, you know, just on and on and on. And um, I just am clear that it's time. And so I really do um, appeal to you um, to repeal this unjust law. Um, and a lot of people have said it's racist based and um, um, separating whites and blacks during the Renaissance time in 1926. <coughs> um, and it's just, it keeps evolving and evolving and evolving. And it's, the, the injustice never changes. It's still the same. And I'm excited that we're having these kind of dialogues to really appeal, potentially repeal this law. Um, thank you. May I add another point, please? Um, uh, let's let's uh, allow the last gentleman to uh, give his testimony. Yeah, let me speak first and then you. Oh, you. And then we can um, open up the. I know you. Uh, Thank you, Steen members of the council. My name's Matt. I don't really have an affiliation other than I like to dance. Um, I'm very confident about this law passing through this committee and moving on to the next step. I know each of you have supported the LGBTQ community in various different ways. Um, I think this bill is an opportunity for more than just a photo, but to actually stand behind the same community. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two different points. I'm gonna talk about the economics that are, are happening now 
because of the current dance situation, and then I would like to address quality of life arguments. So what I'm trying to do is basically take the side of someone who is against it and argue against them. So specifically more conservative members of our community who might be more interested in economics, for example. So politically, each party has views on government involvement in economics that are different. New York City is the most economically segregated city in the United States. It is number one. The current legal dance culture presents <clears throat> a number of economic hurdles which hurt the lower economic classes the most. Door fees are substantial. People making minimum wage, it's almost 3% of their income if they go out twice a month. On top of door fees, wardrobes must be maintained, typically expensive clothing and shoes just to get through the door. There are other incidental costs like transportation since the boroughs are underserved. This culture of paying means that the lower class cannot afford to dance as others can. I would argue that they need it more than us. With more establishments, there are more choices, more competition to lower or eliminate door fees. Instead of paying door fees, people will buy alcohol, which carries a higher tariff. Attracting more people means more liquor sales, which means more city-state revenue. Now for socioeconomics. As an example, many establishments routinely and openly use asymmetric gender-based prices. This is illegal, and it goes unenforced for uh, license holders. This fee segregates males along economic lines, keeping out lower classes to curate a specific club experience. Their door policies are discriminatory, weeding out those who don't fit the desired look. This includes more than just racism, it includes anyone who doesn't fit uh, what they want to see. This specific regulation creates one class of people who are allowed to dance and one that it is not. And that is not just in establishments that don't allow dance, but in establishments that do. This class of people is dictated by less than 100 individuals in the city. It's actually far less because they own multiple establishments and apparently most are strip clubs. There's an oligopoly on dance in this city and they get away with antisocial behavior because of it. I can't imagine people who believe in small government would agree with limited choice on venue because of government regulations, limited access to existing venues because of government regulations, artificially limiting business creation, job creation, and spending opportunities because of regulations not supporting growth of existing small businesses and requiring big government to police what should be policed locally by community boards. So for quality of life, I've just established a group of people which are being economically and socially excluded from dancing, okay. Um, yeah, I'll just skip that. I mean, we've heard the quality of life arguments regardless. So anyway, by <clears throat> repealing this law, we can release the city's white knuckled grip on the battering ram that broke Stonewall. Thank you for your time. Yeah, I just wanted to add one point I was thinking about for quite a while. Uh, we have the 1954 ruling that separate is not equal. And I was thinking of applying it in a very unusual way, perhaps. If you think about the restaurants in New York City, which have tables and people come in, sit down and eat. I assume that there are very strict safety standards, exit signs in case of fire, etc. Now imagine this establishment clears the tables, puts it someplace in storage. Now the people are standing. They turn on the music and now they say, you may dance. Is the safety now greater or less? I would think you're safer now. The tables are not around. If there's fire, you can leave the place. And if you're dancing, you're not drunk. Because if you're drunk, you're sloppy on the floor and everyone will avoid you. So I think the separate but equal principle still applies to dancing. All these ridiculous safety regulations make no sense. If a place is safe to have 150 people sitting on tables, eating food, and getting drunk, and then you remove the table, they drink less, and now they want to dance, and it's not legal. So I would recommend that you have the department of, the fire department determine whether an eating establishment is less safe when the tables are removed and the people start dancing. Otherwise, you really have a racist law. I think it's a racist law. I'm making a joke now. Who's the better dancer here besides me? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, uh, just quick questions for Justin, just for um, his clarity and specifics. So you, you currently own a space in the Youth Group 12 area? Yes. Oh. Yes. In Bushwick, uh, sorry, Ridgewood? Ridgewood, yeah. All right. Um, you, so you allow dancing. You have a dance parties, as you said, Mr. Sundays, and right? Yeah. You know, my understanding of the law is actually that when it's outdoors, the cabaret law or the cabaret license isn't required. So we do not have a cabaret license outdoors. But as we're opening our indoor space, we are we've done all of the things we're we're nearly finished with construction. So we've done all of the things that we need to do. Uh, and once we get our inspections, we're prepared uh, to to go to DCA to get our cabaret um, license should should it remain on the books when we end our process. Right. Um, I guess my, my question is, if that space that you're applying for a cabaret license for was not used for dance events or dance parties, would you need to apply for a cabaret license in order just to open it and run no. a bar? You no. don't? No. So technically, you are getting a license to allow dancing. Yeah, and as I understand it, um, we would have to do most of the same things. Um, do we, we're required by law to do almost everything um, that we have to do to get a cabaret license, whether or not cabaret is there. Right. So it's one of the one of the proponents of uh, of the cabaret law earlier said something about how it's a good thing that the Department of Consumer Affairs kind of acts as this clearinghouse and has this checklist. But since when does the Department of Buildings not show up and give you an inspection and you need to go to the Department of Consumer Affairs so that they can say, oh, yes, the Department of uh, Buildings came and gave you an inspection. Good job. Oh, did the fire department come too? Like, the fire department's going to come. The Department of Buildings is going to come. The Department of Health is going to come. You're going to go to the community board anyway. You're going to have to get your license from the state liquor authority. And these are all things that you have to do in order to go to the Department of Consumer Affairs. So it's this superfluous step that you have to take that just costs you money and 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 the very very few people can actually um adhere to anyway because they're not in the in the specific use group area that we are okay well, great thanks thanks for sharing that appreciate okay. it well thank you guys thanks for testifying thank, thank you. you thank you um oh, let's go to the next panel we have nikki brown from dance liberation network we have Julia from the New York City Artists Coalition. We have Wolfgang Bush, Arts from the Heart. And we have Alan Sh Sugarman or Sugar Sugarman. Okay, we have one more chair. Seems like uh, someone we called up is not here. Um, I'm gonna call up uh, my good friend, Ali Coleman from House Coalition. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alan Sugarman. I'm an attorney here in New York City. I'm a social dancer. I submitted a statement in June and written to the council since then. Uh, first, I want to deal with um, a couple of business issues. Uh, Eli uh, Yaman uh, didn't, was not able to come, and Mercedes Ellington submitted his statement, uh, but that was, that's not in the record. That Eli Yaman is a musician affected by this law. And secondly, I have a statement from Cafe Tallulah, Greg Hunt, which I will submit. Uh, he is an owner of a beautiful facility at Columbus and 71st Street with a first class lounge downstairs, and he's unable to allow dancing there, directly affected by this law. Unfortunately, he's in an area zone not for dancing, and this will not solve his problems. 
uh, everyone is giving their uh, anecdotes. So my first experience with the dancing restrictions was in 1956 in Elizabethton, Tennessee, when I was uh, in the fifth grade. And the locals in this rather reactionary community didn't like Elvis Presley, mentioned earlier. And they passed a resolution that you could not have social dancing in the schools. And I promptly uh, prepared a petition to assert my, our First Amendment rights. All my classmates signed it, and I was threatened to be kicked out of school for that. So this goes back a long way for me. Um, I started dancing seriously in the 90s and f was fortunate to meet my wife uh, in our endeavors as Lindy Hoppers. So I support the repeal of the cabaret law if for no other reason than it's an erratic, unconstitutional, unconstitutional enforcement. Uh, it's widely ignored, but unfortunately still has an impact in smaller venues, which are not willing to risk violation of even a rarely enforced law, such as Tallulah. They have a, millions of dollars into this uh, restaurant, and they can't take the chance of being shut down for a night. Uh, I think that's something you should take into account. I want to bring to your attention that on November 29, 2017, the Hilton Hotel on 54th Street, which has no cabaret license, is hosting a gala benefit open to the public by the Alvin Ailey Dance Company featuring patron dancing. Most hotels ignore the cabaret law. I don't know how they got away with it. And oh, by the way, outdoor dancing under the strict words of the law still requires a cabaret law. But it's just not fair or appropriate for some powerful or favored venues to not face enforcement while others do. I want to make a point, too, about the demographics affected by the cabaret law. Every demographic is enforced. When Julianne came in with this, and I hate to use the word Nazi-like enforcement, everyone was affected. The gays were affected. Blacks were affected, but so were Latinos, so were Jews, so were white people, so were people who did folk dancing, Greek dancing. We were all affected. And all of this racist rhetoric is not useful at all. The only historian who's studied this period says there is no evidence that that was the original intent of the law. Indeed, people sometimes cite the three musician rule against saxophones, etc. That didn't come into place until 1961. The words running wild, do we know what running wild is? Do you want to Google that? You might note that that was a very famous review in 1923 about Charleston dancing. It started the Charleston craze, done mostly by white flappers, and I just confirmed that with Miss uh, um, Ellington. And this was the time when her father came to town. So bef the other thing is that it's just not helpful to go to the community boards and tell them that their concerns about congestion and noise makes them racist. And I don't think that is very helpful. And unfortunately, it's also not true. There's no doubt that there's been racism in the enforcement of this law. I want to get also into the point of the, this recent amendment on the definition of a nightlife establishment. The way I read this, it will make many, many restaurants in the city subject to uh, a, considered to be a nightlife establishment. Uh, you only have to have 2,500 square feet or more and over 150 persons to be dragged into this. I think that entire provision should just go, and you should go back to the original version which just repeals the law simply. And this is, as others have noted, uh, this is the first step in modernizing the regulation of dancing. And the fire and building codes refer to dancing without defining what it is. And oddly, as the gentleman pointed out before, and he took the words out of my mouth, these codes in some instances allow a greater density of patrons for dining than dancing. Though in a fire, tables are obstructions. I don't understand this. We have to figure out a way to do a zero-based analysis of the fire laws and the construction laws so they make sense. And they should also apply to everybody. Hotels, 
nonprofits, clubs, catering halls, membership organizations, and religious institutions. If we're going to have a law in the city that is does, that uses dancing as a criteria, it must apply to everyone. Otherwise, it's unfair and also will be applied, I would agree, in a racist manner, most likely by those with that intent. So, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Happy Thursday, everyone. My name is Ali Coleman. I'm um, part of House Coalition. New York City party organizer for 23 years, a dancer going out in New York since the late 70s. And I had a written statement here, but I've been hearing a lot of stuff about um, quality of life. I have a question, who's quality of life? Like, whose quality of life are we talking about? Are we talking about all New Yorkers' quality of life or just the people who are opposed to people actually dancing and having fun? Um, they, 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 they were speaking earlier, and none of them are here now to rebut anything, but they spoke on issues of, of people just running wildly through the streets and bars are going to open up. They're acting as if business owners aren't going to pay attention to the law. Like, business, we are, we're not, your, we're not adversaries. We're neighbors. We're... We live in the city, too. We pay taxes. So, of course, we're going to pay attention to the laws. We're not just going to open up a club. I'm a dancer. I don't go into a place if I don't feel I'm safe. I'm not going to go in the basement. I, I remember Happy Land. I remember all those places. So we're, we're kind of speaking. Um, it seems like they're speaking where we don't have a consciousness, like we're just going to run rampant through the city because we want to dance. No, it's more about us just wanting to be a part of this city and having a voice. And that's why we're, me personally, I'm so very happy to be sitting in this seat along with everyone else with the opportunity just to say what we want to say. I said a lot last time. I'm going to keep it even shorter than three minutes because I want to go home too. <laughs> and um, I just want everybody to know that we want to work together. We're not going to just run rampant because the law doesn't exist anymore. There are other laws that exist. We just want this one off the books. That's all. Allie, quick question. Yes. If there were less places to dance, would that impede on your quality of life? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, yes, <laughs> my quality of life has already been involved. I mean, I, I did testify to that last time. It, it definitely impedes my quality of life as a DJ that plays in these small places living in Clinton Hill with the rent is going higher and higher and higher, having less and less work, it's, yep. yes, it impedes for sure. All right, thanks. Hello, um, my name is Julia Sinelnikova and I'm an independent artist and event organizer based in New York for the past decade. To start out, I would like to reemphasize a statistic that was brought up earlier. 97 out of 10,000 venues have a cabaret license. 1%. I gave a general statement at the June 18th hearing against the cabaret law for its repeal. Today, I want to talk about some of the New York-based community arts organizations I have worked with um, in the context of the struggle against the cabaret law. For five years until 2014, I was a volunteer and co-lead organizer of Bushwick Open Studios, uh, also known as Arts in Bushwick. Since 2014, I have served as the gallery manager of Vector Gallery New York under the directorship of artist J.J. Bryan. At its height, under the leadership of our team, Bushwick Open Studios encompassed 2,000 artists and 10,000 annual visitors. This is a free public festival organized by an all-volunteer team with no external funding outside of small donations from local businesses. To keep it short, the festival has impacted many, helped get artists into galleries where they can sell work, and garnered several full-length New York Times reviews. However, we always struggled with funding directed mostly towards maintenance of a website and printed maps. In the early years, we put on an official music festival as part of the programming. Events where we could reasonably accept donations at the door and for refreshments helped provide a stable internal source of funding 
But over time, our ability to find licensed local DIY venues, which could consistently and safely house these events, caused us to eliminate music and dancing-oriented events. As a coalition of volunteers managing a vast database and constituency, we became unable to fund robust official programming as an independent organization. Nowadays, Bushwick Open Studios continues, and I plan to participate as an artist next weekend. However, the team and the funding has been greatly diminished as the neighborhood became more gentrified and policed. Vector Gallery is a performance and visual arts space which has had three physical locations in New York in the past few years. My partner, JJ Bryan, was here today but has left to sign our fourth lease in East Williamsburg. I think the number of times we have had to move is a testimony enough to how hard it is to afford and maintain a DIY space in New York. The gallery has been reviewed by countless publications and been on national television. Repeal of the cabaret law would help us grow by making it easier for us to put on events, um, which could be better publicized and even oriented towards social dancing. As an LGBTQ-run and friendly space, it would take away our fears that our performance art events will be mistaken by law enforcement and shut down as dancing-oriented events and shut down. Um, given the cabaret law's history of targeting LGBTQ spaces and sometimes inciting violence, its enforcement is something we fear as we value the safety of our patrons. In closing, in this political era, keeping our community spaces free and open to show the world that New York is still a beacon for diversity has never been so important. Uh, New York legislators I give, uh, give us the tools to provide safe spaces and end the racist cabaret law which defunds and destroys culture. Instead, fund our spaces and fund young artists who are the architects of our future and of technological solutions. Let New York City dance. Hello, uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Nikki Brown. I'm the managing director of Boiler Room, an international music platform with an office in Williamsburg. We produce music events across a wide spectrum of genres from contemporary jazz and salsa to techno and hip hop, most of which are live streamed <clears throat> around the world in an effort to give global visibility to burgeoning local music scenes. On average, my team and I interface with hundreds to thousands of New York City venues, musicians, and creatives each year. And I cannot stress enough the impact that music and dance venues, <clears throat> sorry, I'm a little sick, and events have on this city's creative community. People in pursuit of dance in very literal terms create opportunities, jobs, and income for New York's creative community. For many creatives, musicians, and otherwise, spaces that regularly host music and dance events <clears throat> act as both places of employment and career launch pads. Nightlife and dance events are often entry points to creative careers for many New Yorkers, from graphic designers who got their start making dance event flyers to set designers who began doing party decor. We should be nurturing these spaces, and lear spaces of learning, not making them more vulnerable, vulnerable and thus remo removing these vital opportunities. Landing a job in a creative field in New York isn't getting any easier, so to threaten a very vital avenue, nightlife, is a shame in a city that posits itself as one of the creative capitals of the world, and a bit of, bit of a slap in the face to the creative dr creatives that drive the city's cultural cachet. The cabaret law is a very real threat to small business owners, workers, and creatives, and has no practical merit or ethical place in a city as progressive and creative as ours. If the very real cultural impact of New York's creative community and maintaining the spaces that often give those creatives their starts isn't enough to sway you, think about the economic impact that these music and dance venues and events have on our city. The result of the mayor's office's first ever music industry economic impact study showed just how big of a revenue driver music is for the city. The music industry accounts for 60,000 jobs, $5 billion in wages, and about $21 billion in economic output. All of that music has to be hosted somewhere, and with less than 1% of food and beverage establishments in possession of a cabaret license, that means that the vast, vast majority of this money-making activity is being done illegally. <clears throat> this leaves those businesses, and especially the small businesses among them, extremely vulnerable. The owner of a small bar in Bed-Stuy is at risk of losing her business and liquor license, her bartenders are at risk of loss of wages, and we as a city are at risk of jeopardizing a $21 billion industry. After conducting a study to demonstrate just how vital and sub vital music and subsequently dances to our city's economy, that the city has allowed this law to remain on the books is astounding. Why not choose to protect an industry that fuels us, the city's economy? Why not say to every musician, dancer, venue owner, and employee that you value their cultural and economic contribution enough to protect them against such an antiquated law? The time is now for change, and we look to you, city council, to make that change. Please do the right thing, get rid of this repressive law, protect our city's creative community, and repeal the cabaret law now.
Thank you all for your testimony. Appreciate all the stories um, and testimony you gave. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a five minute break, uh, but before I do, uh, the next panel is Gail Madeira, Hannah Ju, Joe, Anna Rockefeller Garcia, and Akeem, Akeem Funk Buddha from World Dance Community.
Ladies and gentlemen, may I, have, may I have your attention, please? May I have your attention? We are ready to reconvene. Shh. Thank you. We are ready to reconvene. So please, at this time, everyone have their seats. Thank you very much. You may begin. Yeah. Is, the mic is the microphone on? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Gail Madeira. I've been a dancer for 42 years and a professional ballet and modern dancer in New York City since 1992. I started social dancing 20 years ago and started dancing Argentine tango 11 years ago. I'm a two-time US tango champion and the webmaster for a number of New York City tango websites. I want to point out that we have a crisis of obesity in this country and in New York City as well. We also have a crisis of disconnection, people interacting with screens instead of each other. In Buenos Aires, Argentina, which is the mecca of tango, there are around 100 to 200 tango events every night. In those events, you see old women dancing with their grandsons, cab drivers dancing with bankers, Asians dancing with Russians, etc. The question really comes down to money versus health and well-being. The dancers of New York City have a dream. We have a dream of getting people off their seats, off their screens, to dance with each other. We have a dream of seeing dance everywhere, making the people of New York City healthier, happier, and more peaceful. Not just the wealthy who can afford the high costs of a cabaret license and the high costs of the cover to get into those places, but for everyone. Anything that can be done to get more people to dance and interact in person should not only be allowed, it should be encouraged. And I want to thank you guys for pursuing this, and I want to let you know that we understand that this is just the first step in a long process of figuring out how to safely support dancing in New York City. We are happy and excited to help you with this process. Perhaps the next steps after repeal, I'd like to already talk about after repeal, would be to include a more granular treatment of dance venues so that social dancing is not lumped in with raves or big nightclubs, nor with bars that have a lot of drinkers, as well as a renovation of the zoning laws. And we want to work with you and not just, you know, often lawmakers are sort of abandoned after they have one big push for something. And I, I will be the point person for Tango to let people know why we're having this hearing. A lot of people didn't realize that that this hearing needed to happen um, and why, and I want to let people know. So thank you very much for your work. Good afternoon, my name is Hannah Ju. I'm here on behalf of Dance NYC, and Dance NYC is a service organization um, working to advance the dance field, especially in the areas of racial equity um, and inclusion of disabled people in dance. Um, and today I'm here to endorse the proposed bill intro, number 1652, and call for the repeal of the cabaret law. Um, and in doing so, I support the Let NYC Dance Coalition and join my colleague advocates here today in recognizing the many, many challenges posed by the cabaret law, and I'd like to bring forth some of the points articulated by the um, coalition and the Dance Liberation Network, which are that the law prohibits dancing in all establishments without cabaret license, which is virtually unattainable. It drives NYC's thriving dance culture into unregulated, potentially dangerous environments. The law was originally enacted to break up black jazz clubs in the 1920s, and currently a very small percentage of NYC bars and restaurants can legally allow dancing in their spaces. And finally, it restricts economy and freedom of expression. Um, and these points echo much of what has already been said today, and I would like to also emphasize that Dance NYC opposes the significant barriers to creativity and free expression created by this law and recognizes that this is about making our city a more equitable place, um, which the law undermines. Um, we also like to advocate the growth and vibrancy of social dance um, and dance outside of conventional spaces like theaters um, and like to highlight that it is these types of dances that are often um, not provided equitable resources um, and the visibility that they deserve. Um, 
And also that these dance forms are essential to the wider dance ecology, to moving forward the art form and all of the people of our city, including artists, business owners, and everyday New Yorkers. Um, and so to close, I'd just like to thank Chairman Espinal and all of the sponsoring council members. Peace, yes. Um, peace, that's the way hip hop um, was used to always greeting people, peace, um, because it is obviously uh, a movement of peace. My name is Anna Rockefeller Garcia. Rockefeller because I rock the fellas. I couldn't rock the fellas in my neighborhood, or, right, unless I was out there with them. Couldn't do it in my living room. I got this name because I was able to move up the ranks um, doing the moves that the guys did, so I was rocking the fellas. Internationally, I am hired to judge, teach, um, speak about the history, the aesthetic, as a woman or just as a member, gender neutral, of this hip hop community. That started in New York City. I was born in Mount Sinai, East Harlem, and we moved to the Bronx because my dad thought it was safer. <laughs> I love my dad. And um, <laughs> the Bronx has been the place where I have really held court. I've been able to be uh, on the Bessie's Dance and Performance uh, Awards Committee. I am actually an artist in residence at the American Tap Dance Foundation. I don't tap, but because they see what I have and how I bring people together, I am an artist in residency there. I've done a lot of extensive work in the community. I work with the Department of Education. I work in high schools. And a lot of times the teenagers will tell me, oh, rock, but you know, where are we going? Where are you taking me? You know, um, how amazing is this thing about being a, dance, being a dancer and having it as a career? And I try to tell them, you, you can evolve. You're in New York City. There's so much available to you here. And so I have evolved, and now I curate events. The 501c3 that me and my husband founded, New York's only breakdance theater, 501c3, Full Circle Productions in the Bronx, um, has been able to receive funding awards because we apply. We have a board that helps us create proposals so that we can curate dance events at museums and libraries, galleries, church basements. Why? Because there are no clubs. Why? Because I can't perform at the Roseland because that was closed down. Palladium, that was closed down. Um, the Underground. Webster Hall, just closed. Um, a lot of these places now are closed. Where are our kids going? And so people complain because we're dancing in the subway trains. OK, why are we there? Why are we dancing in the subway trains? Because we have no place else to go. And so you want us to go where? And so I think that this law not only has to be repealed, amended, and like the sister here was talking about, um, next steps, I believe that when you finally repeal this law and you, you know, give these places the ability to have dance, can you then connect a dance company, a dance crew, a choreographer, a teacher to that place so that they can be in residency and they can curate the performances and the workshops that are happening within that bar, cafe, restaurant? Because that's what we need to also have leadership that will help um, put this in, in, in a, just a better reference. I am producing a party tomorrow at Camaradas, which is a bar, um, in East Harlem. Two weeks from there at Angel of Harlem on 122nd Street in Frederick Douglass, a restaurant, but I'm curating a dance party, so they will move the tables. She's a little nervous, so she will keep some tables up so she can continue keeping the kitchen open, but I'm not trying to bring problems to anyone. I do want to have dance thrive in New York City. I am only as a successful as I am, even being a professor at the New School University, because there were places to go as a youngster and a young adult in New York City. And so I am asking you to please repeal this law, but also amend it and come to some of the leaders in the community to help with um, the new law that will be in place. You want me to hold that for you? Yeah, please do. Technology. There's also a video online that you can download okay. after today. Okay. Yes. Um, Everybody, my name is Akim, a.k.a. Akim Funk Buddha. Um, I've been participating in the theater world, the dance world, music world, uh, poetry slam world, and of course hip-hop world, and this world. Um, if it was up to me, I would make dancing mandatory. Um, and before we tar started today's session, I would say all of you sitting over there, even the security guards, they got to dance. And I just know things would move a lot smoother. Having said all of that, I was affected mostly by this cabaret law in, I um, can't remember what, what year it was exactly, sometime in the 90s, where I was performing at Baby Jupiter. And um, uh, 
really, it was quite, it felt like I was in a sci-fi because the, the cops would roll in and the owner of the venue would say, stop dancing. And so what I had to do to prepare for this was I would tell the audience, if the cops come in, everybody just freeze. And, um, and or I would tell the musicians to stop hitting their instruments, but everybody keep dancing and internalize the sound. Now, that might just sound like poetic theatrics, and it is, but really, what is dance? Is dance responding to movement, to, to music? Is, what if you take away the music? Is it then dance? Um, whatever it is, it is our first tongue. And this thing I'm doing now called language is learned. When a baby is born, it's making music. It's crying. Crying is music. When it's crawling, it's, it's dancing. It's an intuitive art form. Um, now that I have won uh, an award um, from the U.S.-Japan Commission, also the National Endowment of the Arts. I've also gotten a, a grant from the St State Department in um, uh, Cultural Affairs, and I've gotten grants from the Jerome Foundation. Um, I have started to turn all this awareness into a teaching practice, and I teach kids with uh, so-called ADD, uh, learning differences, uh, different states of autism. And I noticed that these kids, their stage fright or their, sometimes even their autism, it kind of takes a, a hiatus once they start dancing. And it actually has, has helped them become more confident and has helped them uh, become more present human beings. And I realized that Wow, all these years of just dancing. Um, uh, I spent also years busking on the streets and um, body painting myself and being harassed by police, being told, don't do that here. And I would say to the cop, this is my expression. This is my human right. This is my vocabulary. This is my currency. And I have a right to do it. Um, after having many... Um, tough times on the performing on the streets, I was able to take my show and work indoors. And now, here today, I say to you that the biggest mistake that this planet is making, not even the country, not even just New York, is really undermining what dance is. And every day there's a new app and there's a new technology, and we're making films about the force and, and looking for dark crystals and so on. Really, we're supposed to come together and dance. And when we figure that out, everything else will figure itself out. So we do need to dance on the sidewalks, dance wherever there's space. We need to be dancing. And uh, some people were saying before, we can't just have people dancing everywhere. I say, yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Appreciate your testimony. Appreciate all your testimony. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I'd like to call up Tom Martigotti, Ginny Hopper, Jonathan Friel, Glenn Raymond, so Glenn Raymond, Jonathan Friel, Ginny Hopper, and Tom Martigotti. Martigotti? Martigotti? Marnetti. Yeah. All right, I'm going to call one more. You know, I'll call the last two people up. Um, we have Rachel Santos and Megan Kalia. Rachel Santos and Megan Kalia. Is there anyone else that, that was hoping to testify today here whose name hasn't been called? Okay, all right, so you're the last panel. You may begin, either side, doesn't matter. You can go. The sooner we begin, the sooner we can go. <laughs> this panel? Great, awesome. Um, 
I did not write anything in preparation for this. Woke up this morning late. I work in nightlife and have for a long time in Manhattan. Uh, I think in the city's eyes, I would probably be one of the bigger offenders of uh, illegal dancing in my places over the years in Manhattan. Uh, this past summer, I retired from nightlife. I'm now in the restaurant business. I own five restaurants in Manhattan. And so I think I'm uniquely qualified to discuss, in essence, the cabaret laws. I have been hit with them a number of times. I've been marched a number of times. And I realized very early on, obviously, the cabaret laws are a joke. We all know that. They've been, you know, everybody said that, great. You, you hit on something very early on that, that is actually one of the real issues. And the, the word arbitrary has been banded about today a lot. When you hear the word arbitrary, it's actually changing the word called pretext. They're coming in to stop what you're doing. They're using dancing as a, they're using the cabaret laws as a pretext to stop what you're doing. Okay? So when, you know, when the cabaret laws, w which will be repealed, they should be, they will continue, though, to, to try to stop what you're doing under pretext of different other, uh, other laws that are, that are currently on the books. Um, so I just want to say that my, my, my concern is what happens next. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the, the people that really, the police are the ones that are the ones that are in charge of these laws. People, everybody else in the government goes home at night. The police are who we interact with on a nightly basis, and I have for years and 15 to 18 years at this point. And for the most part, they are, they are, they are decent. But, you know, the real issue here is when you try to open up a place in Manhattan, uh, you will get a knock on the door from a sergeant or from some of the community board saying, you'll be cool, but don't do any hip-hop nights or don't do any gay nights. And this is, the, this is really the issue, the issue here. And we can talk all night about, you know, changing the, you know, the cabaret laws, but this is what's really happening on the street, is that they're going to find another way to shut you down. Um, are the cabaret laws racist? 100%. Will that stop once they're repealed? Absolutely not. Uh, Right now, between the well-off condo owners in New York City and the police, it's very tough to operate anywhere around residences. Uh, the, the noise control laws are way, way, way too low. So what's going to happen next is going to hit you with the noise abatement laws, which are very, very tough. Um, and, the, and, uh, and also they hit you with the unsafe, uh, unsafe establishment. So the police come in. They, they see a broken piece of bottle on the floor. They hit you with another ticket that says unsafe establishment, which is just as big as a, as a, a cabaret ticket. Um, you mentioned something early on that I thought was very sharp when they were talking about the, 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 um, the uh, video camera system, how you want to take that out of the police hands. You couldn't be more right about that. We have to t you have to take as much things out of the police's hands as possible. Because what's going to happen, then you use the video cameras as a pretext to get into your establishment. Um, that, I think, I think you really got something there. And I think that's really the pretext, if anything, is that the police enter in your establishment to give you tickets. People aren't going to like dancing. People who live in high-end residences aren't going to like dancing. So what are they going to start doing? They're going to start hitting, you know, call 311, start complaining uh, about noise, and, and, and then get it that way. Uh, I do commend you unbelievably for, for, for doing this. I think it's a great step in, in, in the direction. I would like to just say one last thing, that obviously no many people out here go to nightclubs, and I, I guarantee you not one of them has ever ordered food in a nightclub before. The idea that we require nightclubs to serve food is the most ridiculous and antiquated law other than cabaret there is. Uh, that is the next step. Once you repeal a cabaret, they can start that's going to be the biggest hurdle now is that all the nightclubs are going to have fake menus for food. If you could repeal both the cabaret and the idea that in New York City, at a nightclub, you have to be able to serve food with alcohol, which is the most ridiculous law other than the cabaret law there is, that would be a massive step in the direction of, of, of separating police from nightlife and putting the control of nightlife back into other city agencies. The idea if you spread it around not give it all one agency all the, all, you know, all the, uh, all the um, important uh, control. I mean, taking away from consumer affairs, best idea in the world. Consumer affairs is the toughest city agency to deal with. Even to renew your, your cafe license outside is, is impossible. But I, I do think that you have to be prepared next for what happens next. Because the police, 
and the, and the community boards with the guy from Community Board 5. I mean, that guy from Community Board 5 is who we deal with. He is what's holding you back. That guy from Board 5 is not going to vote, or his community board is not going to vote for any place that's going to even say they're going to have dancing. I mean, we can sit up here all day, but that guy from the Community Board 5 who's sitting right here, he's no, he's, he doesn't want to dance in his neighborhood. He represents the people in his neighborhood who own high-end condos. That's who he represents. He doesn't represent you. He doesn't represent people who want to dance. That's who he represents. So he's going to sit up here all day and say, yeah, you know what, I'm a progressive, we're the progressive city, but he does not, not want the nightclub next door to him or even the local bar to have dancing. So I think that you have to do, I think you have to piggyback a couple of items that are going to completely separate almost church and state here. The police should not be the sole, the sole control of nightlife, which they are. And you're right about the pretext with the cameras. That's, that's an idea of control. That's how they can get in and then require you to do other things. Um, I, I, I will go back to the food uh, saying that's just crazy uh, because that, that, you know, that brings in other city agencies and this and that. And by the way, it's a lot easier to open up if you don't have to build a kitchen to have a fake menu. I, mean, I know people that build out fake kitchens and have a fake menu just to pass code or to, to be open up. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I mean, people in Brooklyn can afford $200,000 kitchens like we can in Manhattan to basically serve drinks. Uh, I think that is... I think one, one, in the, one has to go with the other. Um, if, you know, you want uh, I'll ask you to wrap up only yeah. for the yeah. sake of I'm time. Done. Yeah. You done? All right. I can go on, but, but I thanks, thanks for your testimony. Cool. Appreciate it. Hi, everybody. My name is Rachel Santos, and I am here with you today, actually, to read a testimony on behalf of someone else who is um, not wanting to put his event, his livelihood, and the community and culture that that event fosters at risk under the current cabaret laws. So the following is his testimony. As many producers of dance events, I fear enforcement of the city's cabaret law, which is why I am submitting my anonymous written testimony. I am an American citizen and a New Yorker. I have been a tango dancer for over 22 years. Tango has been a transformative experience for me and many people I know. It is a major part of my cultural identity and how I relate to other people. Social tango dancing is a subtle communication between the partners and between couples on the dance floor. It welcomes people of all ages and cultures. It is a popular art of great cultural significance, declared a treasured heritage of humanity by UNESCO. It has been shown to have numerous health benefits, among them relieving the symptoms of Parkinson's disease and preventing Alzheimer's disease. By contrast with stage tango, it does not involve any acrobatic moves. It is noiseless and calm. Couples move around the dance floor gently, in harmony with each other, to beautiful music that is played at much lower volume than at an average bar or club. A typical tango dance in New York City attracts no more than 100 people during the week and on occasion around 200 on weekends. Affordable dance spaces have been rapidly disappearing in Manhattan. And on top of that, the enforcement of the arcane cabaret law has made it next to impossible to have a tango dance in public space that serves food and drink. Most public spaces, such as restaurants and bars, which have a dance space and pay for the cabaret license, charge upward of $3,000 per night, which is far beyond what our small-scale tango events are able to afford. The few venues that have some space to dance and are willing to rent it to tango events at a lower rate are either unable to obtain a cabaret license or do not consider it worth their time and expense. Lately, the New York City tango community suffered several closings of long-running events by city inspectors because places where they were held did not have a cabaret license. Tango events are being increasingly forced into dance studios or most function underground in Manhattan. For a survival of a popular dance such as tango, having it danced in public spaces that serve food and drink is essential, though tango dancers never drink very much as it is a dance requiring balance and precision. A place that welcomes dancers and non-dancers alike allows those who do not yet dance tango to watch it and become interested while having food or drink or otherwise socializing. 
Because of the enforcement of the cabaret law, there are almost no places like that left in the city. And tango is getting increasingly forced underground or into dance studios, drastically cutting down on the exposure of new people to social tango dancing. At the same time, many dance studios which provided classrooms for tango events have recently closed because of the rent hikes. While preventing the prohibitive rent hikes in the city may be an insurmountable task, it seems much more feasible to repeal the arcane cabaret law or at least change it to exempt culturally significant dance forms like tango. I hope that this can be done for the sake of the survival of tango dancing in New York City. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for um, taking the time. Hello. And thank you for joining me on my radio show earlier this summer as well on WBAI. Uh, I've been a, I guess, social activist um, for the underground communities of New York City, utilizing the public airwaves of um, our community radio station, longstanding WBAI. Jenny? Yeah. Before you continue, can you just state mm -hmm. your name for the... For the oh, this is Jeannie thing. Hopper, Liquid Sound Lounge, and I'm a DJ, as well as radio producer and wear a lot of hats in the community. Um, I did have a prepared statement, but I kind of want to reflect on a lot of the things that I've actually just heard today and that I've been covering. Um, Jaime Burkhart, he said um, the issue of somebody, him being targeted by the alt-right, so to speak, and someone from Oregon, um, to be able to harass him in that manner. Um, to me, when 311 came in, that became our biggest harassment in the underground, and not even underground, but community scenes. Uh, that um, compounded by um, the no smoking in establishments law, which I completely agree with, and it's fabulous. <laughs> I'm healthier for it, and so are many of um, us in nightlife. But what happened is, is people went out into the streets, and also there is this 311 line where you can call anonymously. Um, from cases that I've spoke with Norman Siegel, who's worked on many of these cases going back to um, the slipper room. Um, it usually results in, and also even warm up PS1, which I work closely with and built up a community radio station for MoMA PS1. Um, a lot of times it results in one person in the neighborhood, one person calling repeatedly, anonymously, and then 311 has to send um, uh, you know, that alert to the local police department. They have to go investigate. Well, guess whose face is there for them to deal with? That establishment, that person who owns that establishment and their staff. They don't have the face of the person that's complaining. So it's resulted in, now mind you, I know that there are establishments that have violated a lot of um, uh, laws, but I'm talking about um, so the next situation, um, cameras. I know many establishments that put cameras in because of the harassment by the nightlife task force so that they would have documentation of what had happened in their establishment. I have faced DJing where that, task, that nightlife task force shows up the entire place. It's like, I don't want to use this term, but like the bugs just scatter. Everybody leaves as soon as the lights come on. I don't know any other establishment where you're allowed to walk in. If McDonald's, if a health inspector comes in and they come in with a giant task force, we're going to inspect your place, do they suddenly tell everybody to leave and make it so uncomfortable that all the patrons can't even, you know, eat there? I mean, it's, it's excessive force. And that's what this scene has been dealing with. Um, one last thing I want to say quickly is um, I also worked with the Drug Policy Alliance when it came to um, the RAVE Act, which I fear is still on the federal books. And what that RAVE Act means, are you familiar? It means that all of us in an establishment, if someone is doing drugs or there's illegal behavior, sale of drugs, in this case it came up with RAVE and ecstasy and other um, Ill illicit drugs, each one of us is now um, liable, from the bathroom attendant, to the bartender, to the DJ, for the action by a patron. And so this, this became very heavy on a national level, clearly. Um, but in London, what they did is they, the Drug Policy Alliance brought over um, someone from Scotland Yard, and we were able to actually hear how they were able to actually face 
respecting cultural hubs, places that turn in, that create culture that brings a lot of money after the fact. Um, but you need that seed, that space for it to start. And um, how they worked with the clubs. Why? Another person had brought this up too. Improved trust saves lives. So if you can't trust to call the police department as an establishment when something is going on, and instead you're going to be looked at as the problem, the establishment owner, that's very serious. So they got together with the club owners, the police department. So I really urge you to have them at the table um, and be a part of this, what is it called, the, that you want to assemble, the, uh, the nightlife uh, panel or wh whatever. The, what is it? The nightlife. nightlife Association, nightlife, sorry. Nightlife, nightlife Advisory Board and Office yeah, of Nightlife. Yeah, because I do have an issue with the um, Nightlife Association, which was uh, spoke about the gentleman who talked about 1989 to now. There's a lot of issues that come up with that, which is that that law firm and that lawyer, from what I knew from reporting, um, became a firm recommended by the city as expediters for your cabaret I'm licenses. I'm about that, by the way. You're yeah, an expediter for your cabaret licenses. So you go to the city recommended expediter, and you will get your cabaret license easier, faster, um, compared wife to. Was head of consumer affairs. Yeah. So there is a lot of corruption, in my opinion, already um, at play. And it's going to take a lot to unfold all of these layers. But getting rid of the cabaret law is just, I mean, it's a great start. It's a huge start. Because I don't know any other business where the third strike, you're going to be shut down. You can have three shootings in your establishment, and you're not going to be shut down. But for dancing, you are. And by the way, that second fine that you get, they keep adding it up and adding, they add on to it, and you're padlocked until you pay it. And they make it, so it keeps going up every day. Now, how are you going to pay that fine when your establishment isn't even open? How are you going to come up with that money? So last but not least, that means the only people who can afford to have a cabaret license or a legal establishment is big money corporations. And that's what's happened to our scene. Our scene has been corporatized. And I, I will admit it right here. I illegally dance. I illegally throw parties and DJ in illegal spaces. I do. Why? Because I believe in community unity and the diversity of what social dancing is about and what it used to look like. Now I see segregation happening which is because of this corporatization and this harassment, and you can say gentrification, all of it. It's really, really torn people apart. Before, you were gay, straight, every economic status. The freaks, the geeks would want, and then the, the Wall Streets, the uptowns, they'd want to come down and hang out with them. And we'd all, we were all better for it, because we all got to know each other, see each other, and, and we see how music crosses borders from hip-hop being these kids in the Bronx to a, a national phenomenon and even having greater white audiences in some cases if you read Questlove's book, his um, current um, autobiography. Thank, You'll learn a lot. So thank, thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you. I appreciate it. My name is Glenn Raymond. I'm actually in the process of opening a nightclub. I have the honor to... Um, open a nightclub that's very historic in New York. It used to be Sound Factory and Pasha. The new name's gonna be Mecca. I'm going through the loopholes with the community boards and so forth. I think that it's an embarrassment in 2017 that we're even speaking about this. At the end of the day, whoever's gonna be the ambassador of nightlife should be handling the codes. They should be handling the liquor licenses. You don't need a cabaret license for dancing. At the end of the day, you're not opening until the fire departments and everybody else come in. You're gonna have to get fully all your regulations up to code. When it comes to the community boards, 
the cabaret license, it's all punitive damages and not punishment that at the end of the day, the community board is just sitting there to punish you financially. The lawyers want the cabaret license, so this way they have somebody to represent. Abolish that, take away the nightclubs even being seen by the community board. You have, what, 45, 50 members over 50, 60 years old who have nothing better to do with their life but to exert a little bit of power and punish people. Most of the people on the community board don't even own a business. So who are they to tell anybody? Give you stipulations, tell you if you can dance, tell you what you can and cannot do? I think that the, the mayor's office, the councilman's, and everybody in the city should be embarrassed right now. Globally, our nightlife doesn't exist. We're, New York City fell asleep years ago. And at this point right now, you're taking a multi-billion dollar industry and just destroying it. So I have one question. 2017, we're fighting about a cabaret law that should have been wiped out years ago. How about all the homeless people? How about all the methadone clinics that the city is putting in? And all the drugs that are running rampage over our city? Maybe the community board should focus on that because guess what? They're failing. Just move past this. This should already be done. Thank you. Just for, just for clarification, previous city council and previous mayors no, attributed I, to what's going I, on. I'm very familiar with what you do. <laughs> Rafael Espinal and no, his I, colleagues are <laughs> on the right direction. <laughs> I'm very familiar with your office. You do a lot of organic, really, groundwork. And I support Mayor de Blasio's work that he's putting in. He takes a lot of um, black eyes on a lot of stuff. And I think that more club owners should come out and actually support instead of just sitting back. I think that you need to get out there to make the change happen. And I know that the work you're putting in on this, you're going up against a lot of red tape behind the closed doors. So I appreciate everything personally. Yeah, thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. And, thank you. Um, we'll talk, I'm sure. Uh, well, thank you, guys. Thank you. I, that, that's it. Um, we've uh, concluding this hearing. Um, so that means we're one step closer to the repeal. And what happens from now to actually voting this bill out is kind of figuring out uh, you know, what are the security issues that the administration has problems with, what, what, we're, what we are um, comfortable with living with and moving forward with. So that's what's going to happen within, um, from now to the vote. And we can't schedule the vote until that, those conversations happen, those amendments are made. Uh, but that's the only thing getting in the way. And I, I think that uh, we'll be able to be successful if we continue advocating and staying together in this conversation. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. The meeting is adjourned.